Subcommittee will please come to order. Today's hearing is the first in a series of hearings by this subcommittee to examine shocking revelations of gross abuse involving ex-Department of Housing and Urban <coughs> Development officials and other high-ranking officials of the former administration. The Section 8 moderate rehabilitation program was established by the Congress to upgrade substandard rental housing and to provide rent subsidies for low-income families. It is ironic that while the former administration almost succeeded in eliminating this program between 1981 and today, many former top officials became its major financial beneficiaries. Based on an extensive investigation by the Inspector General of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, it appears that favoritism and abuse were pervasive in the administration of this federal rehabilitation and rent subsidy program. Applications pushed and lubricated by politically well-connected, quote, consultants, end quote, received the lion's share of these increasingly scarce funds. Consultants received mind-bogglingly exorbitant fees for fleeting services of dubious legality. In some cases, consultants hired more influential and better connected consultants to obtain hot subsidies under the rehabilitation program. One such expert consultant was former Interior Secretary James Watt. Mr. Watt's only known experience in the field of housing was making Bambi homeless. Yet he received $300,000 in 1986 from a, from a developer for talking to the right people, including HUD Secretary Pierce, to get subsidized funds for a housing project. This subcommittee will give Mr. Watt every opportunity at a subsequent hearing later this month to explain his consulting act activities at HUD. Former HUD officials and others converted influence and connections into considerable profit. Brief conversations yielded fees equivalent to a quarter century of earnings for some of the families this program was designed to help. One consultant, a former special assistant, Secretary Pierce, received $1.3 million in consulting fees. Within this environment of influence peddling, it appears that for a period of several years, the system at HUD for judging and selecting the projects to receive subsidies had all the objectivity of a South Korea Olympic boxing judge. Objective, measurable criteria gave way to political preference. Favoritism, supplanted fairness. While we all believe in the Paperwork Reduction Act, the decision makers at HUD appeared to have carried paperwork reduction to the extreme. There are practically no records for how decisions were made involving hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money. This, at best, is an absurdity. At worst, an attempt to camouflage transactions of dubious propriety and flawed ethics. During the five-year period studied by the HUD Inspector General, it appears that projects in a handful of states where the so-called consultants operated received more than half of the scarce moderate <coughs> rehabilitation funds. Historically, these funds were allocated on a fair share basis according to population and need. Under the fair share formula, 
California, for instance, would have received nearly 17% of the funds, and New York would have received just under 14%. In point of fact, California, the most populous state in the nation, received less than 5% of the funds allocated, and New York received less than 3%. Yet one state, which applying the fair share formula would have received just 3.3%, was given more than 15% of the funds. Specifically, only 15 public housing authorities out of about 3,000 received more than four allocations each during 1984-88. But they were worth over one-third of all units allocated. During a five-year period of the more than 3,000 public housing authorities eligible for moderate rehabilitation funds, only 204 received any. Thus, 93% of those eligible did not receive one single penny. It appears that selection took place not on the basis of demonstrated need, but rather on the basis of the most influential consultant. I think it's important at this stage to discuss the difference between fair share and discretionary allocations of federal funds. Fair share in the terminology of the trade means a formula predicated on a variety of criteria, demographic and otherwise. Discretionary does not mean at the whim of government officials. Discretionary merely means that objectively measurable criteria are expected to be established and funds are allocated on the basis of these objectively measurable criteria. Discretionary does not mean that people who make the decision at their own pleasure can decide who gets federal funds and who doesn't. If one wants to give an analogy from a field which may be more familiar to some, if a university has, has 10,000 applicants for its freshman class and only 1,000 places, a fair share formula would mean a geographically established formula where applicants from various states have a chance on the basis of the population of that state. Discretionary in this context would mean that the university establishes criteria predicated upon grade point averages, SAT scores, other objectively measurable devices, and allocates scarce spaces. It does not mean that the admissions officer, in his own judgment, decides who is admitted without any apparent objective evaluation of applicants. That is what happened here. The HUD Inspector General found that HUD officials frequently agreed to subsidize rents at higher levels than were necessary, and that these artificially inflated rents over the legitimate levels of subsidy may cost the taxpayers more than $413 million. Few domestic problems we face are as severe and as widespread as the availability of low-cost housing. The Congress is determined that every dime we appropriate for low-cost housing be distributed fairly, equitably, and by objective criteria to assist those in greatest need. A system which allows an outrageously frivolous distribution of hundreds of millions of dollars on the basis of influence peddling, rather than the desperate need of children and families in dire need of a roof over their heads, cannot and will not be tolerated. This subcommittee looks forward to working closely with HUD Secretary Jack Kemp, who deserves our strongest commendation 
and I want to underscore this, our strongest commendation for taking Swiss action, swift action, It's no surprise to me that he has moved swiftly and with great intensity to uh, preclude any future impropriety and also to try to ameliorate the effects of any past uh, questionable conduct. Uh, he has pledged his total cooperation to you, Mr. Chairman, to this committee, and I know that with him in charge, the program will work properly in the future and that any past problems will be cleared up post-haste. I join you in those comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Kyle. Congressman Shays of Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to submit for the record my prepared statement and just uh, express my gratitude that, Without in objection. fact, Jack Kemp is our Secretary of HUD and uh, emphasize that he walked into the situation and concur with you that he has taken swift action and responded to the alleged abuses uh, in HUD Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Program well and just say that I look forward to working with you and my other colleagues on this committee as well as the secretary to uh, help save this program and make sure that people it was intended to benefit truly are benefited. And also I might add to, to make sure that we hold those who have abused the system to make sure that we hold them accountable for their actions too. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Um, without objection, the chair would like to introduce into the record the letter to me from Secretary Kemp, um, which uh, outlines his uh, commendable stand and his determination to deal with this issue. Uh, he says in parts, uh, he says in part, the Inspector General's audit indicated that the selection and allocation process for moderate rehabilitation funds in previous years was undocumented, undocumented, ignored existing standards and regulations and was based on the perception and reality of favoritism and abuse of non-public information. I think this letter from Secretary Kemp is of enormous importance. He says in part, previous year awards for which contracts with developers have not yet been executed are put on hold pending further review. I've instructed the Office of Housing, et cetera, to provide a new competitive selection process. And uh, he concludes his letter with a handwritten note uh, which says, Tom, be assured of my, our fullest cooperation with you and the Congress in helping clean up, reform, and move forward on the important goal of rehabbing our housing for low-income people, signed Jack. Uh, our uh, first panel, I, I take it, is, uh, is uh, here. Uh, I'd uh, like to introduce the first panel and then swear you in. We have Mr. Paul A. Adams, Inspector General, Department of Housing and Urban Development. He's accompanied by Mr. John Connors, Assistant Inspector General for Audit. Mr. Patrick Neary, Assistant Inspector General for Investigations. Mr. Alvin Tucker, Deputy Inspector General. Would you gentlemen please stand? <coughs> Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Please be seated. Mr. Adams, we are pleased to have you. And, uh, your entire prepared statement will be made part of the record. You may proceed in any way you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, 
I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss our recent audit and investigation of the Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Program. Our work revealed the process for selecting public housing authorities that received moderate rehabilitation funds until April 1988 was undocumented and ignored existing standards and regulations. This combined with other events, which I will more fully describe, led to a growing perception of favoritism. Early in the review process, we recognized potential criminal violations. Accordingly, we met with officials of the Department of Justice for the purpose of keeping them informed and obtaining guidance on the course of the investigation. The briefings with the Department of Justice continued throughout our investigation, and a copy of our completed report of investigation has been provided to the Public Integrity Section of the Department of Justice and the FBI for their consideration. I have kept the Secretary advised and met with the staff of this subcommittee and the House Committee on Housing and Community Development on several occasions. The results of our audit and investigation work disclosed that the program was poorly managed by HUD headquarters and field offices. Weaknesses were numerous and significant and covered the full spectrum of program activities. The majority of the projects funded over the past five years were selected by PHAs without any open competition and the funded PHAs and projects appeared to be concentrated in certain areas of the nation. Former HUD officials participate as developers, consultants, and or lenders in at least 55 of the projects funded. In other instances, other former government officials also acted in similar capacities. We initiated our review based on prior audit results and on information from a variety of sources, including staff members of the Subcommittee on Housing and Community Development, confidential informants, PHA officials, government employees, and scattered media stories. I might point out that all these sources express concern regarding favoritism and possible payoff to influence the allocations, but were unable to provide any evidence to support their concerns. We pursued each lead provided by these sources during the course of our audit and investigation. In order to conduct our audit and investigation, we had to first gather data regarding program participants. Because HUD had no systematic way of identifying developers, consultants, and lenders involved in the program, our audit staff developed a questionnaire for PHAs receiving funding for more than 25 units. The information received from the PHAs, coupled with allegations cited previously, enabled us to target our audit work. I would now like to discuss some details of the results of the audit and investigative efforts. First, I will discuss the audit work which culminated in our report issued on April 26, 1989. The audit was performed during the period March 88 through December 88 and generally covered activities from January 1, 1984 through December 30, 1988. In addition to our summary report, we have thus far issued 24 audit reports covering PHA activities, seven reports covering field office activities, and a report on a co-insurance lender. Ten additional PHA audits are in process. At this point, I think it would be appropriate to provide a brief overview of the program to assist you in understanding the audit results. The Moderate Rehabilitation Program is authorized by Section 8 of the U.S. Housing Act of 37 as amended. HUD approves program participation by and allocates funding to eligible PHAs. The purpose of the program is to upgrade substandard rental housing and to provide rental subsidies to lower income families. During most of our review period, HUD allocations were made under the headquarters reserve process because Congress each year waived the fair share allocation process. The fair share <coughs> process was designed to distribute funds to localities throughout the nation in line with needs-based formulas developed by HUD's Office of Policy Development and Research the HUD regulations governing the headquarters reserve process provide that when application demand exceeds all approvable applications, HUD will rank the applications based on its assessment of which applications have the best combination of five enumerated criteria. This competitive process is, to, is designed to provide funding to PHAs that are well suited to carry out the program. After an allocation is made to a PHA, 
HUD enters into an annual contributions contract with the PHA spelling out the amounts and terms of the funding arrangement. The PHA then conducts a local competition by soliciting applications from owners and developers. For units determined eligible, the PHA and owners execute an agreement to enter into a housing assistance payment contract. When the units are rehabilitated and the work accepted by the PHA, the housing assistance payment contract is executed for a term of 15 years. The owner receives a contract rent that is defined as a total rent, including the rent paid by the family. During the audit period, about 35,780 units were funded representing contract and budget authority, totaling about 225 million and 3.4 million, respectively. Can Based you explain those two figures? Yes, sir. The, the contract authority would be the yearly amount, and over the extended period would be the 3.4 mil, or billion, excuse me, sir. Based on our audit results, we concluded that there was little assurance that the housing is being provided to those areas having the greatest need. Further, there was minimal or no documentation or accountability for the PHA selected by headquarters to receive funding allocations. Moreover, PHA selected developers without complying with the need for an effective competitive process and often in violation of their own administrative plan. Also, HUD and PHA staff often dictated, excuse me, abdicated their responsibilities to developers, consultants, and in some cases, mortgage lenders. There is little assurance that the units were allocated to PHAs equitably or that the produce were selected competitively. This situation is largely responsible for the widespread perception that exists among program managers and participants alike that the program is headquarters driven, favoring certain PHAs, owners, and developers. May I stop you there for a minute? You have now repeatedly used the term perception of favoritism. In his letter to me, Secretary Kemp speaks of perception and reality of favoritism. Do you agree with both of those characterizations, or are you deliberately using the term only perception of favoritism? I'm deliberately using that, Mr. Chairman. I believe that that should be uh, something that, uh, based on the hearings and subsequent events, should be determined by a body other than myself. So you do not, at this moment, share the Secretary's judgment that there was a reality of favoritism? I think the facts would lead one to conclude that. I'm sorry? I believe the facts could lead one to conclude that. But they haven't yet led you to conclude that. No, sir. Thank you. Our report pointed out that the headquarters selection process dictated a significant shift in the program operations, resulting in only a, about 204 of approximately 3,000 PHAs receiving funding allocations during the five-year period. Ten states received over 51 percent of all units, whereas their fair share percentage, as developed by HUD, was only about 16 percent. Fifteen PHAs received four or more allocations each during the period, representing 33 percent of all units allocated. Former HUD officials and employees actively sought and participated as developers, consultants, or lender representatives in at least 55 projects. In addition, our report cited various conditions that existed in 69 projects we reviewed, which indicate possible project-specific selections by headquarters. S specifically, in 19 projects, we noted that the developers approached PHAs claiming if the PHAs applied for units, an award would probably be made for them. In 25 projects, the developers paid consultants, some of whom were former HUD employees for services that equated in part to lobbying HUD officials on the developer's behalf. In is, the, is the expected process the opposite of this, that the public housing authority applies for units under this program. When it obtains them, it then advertises among a number of developers and presumably uh, the most desirable project gets the units. 
And what That's you correct. are describing is the exact opposite of this process. Some so-called consultants approach a developer. They say, I can get you the units. The developer pays him money. The consultant gets the units. And uh, the housing authority awards the whole thing to the developer who sort of pre-selected himself. That's correct, sir. So the process has been turned completely upside down. That's correct. And sir. has been made completely non-competitive. The facts would indicate that, sir. Excuse me? I say the facts would indicate that. Thank you. In 49 projects, <coughs> the ultimate awards made by HUD and are the PHA a close closely approximate the number of units con owned or controlled by a specific developer. These conditions... Explain, explain that for a minute. A PHA, a public housing authority, ordinarily, one would assume, would, would apply for 100 units or 200 units, round numbers. But in point of fact, there may be a developer who has an existing project with 123 units and that is exactly the number of units that are allocated to this community. That's correct, sir. Go ahead. These conditions demonstrate the absence of the type of open competition at the PHA level intended in HUD regulations. The conditions also fostered a widespread perception among PHA officials that HUD selection process was not governed by the regulatory criteria. The cost in terms of dollars and program integrity are extremely high. As mentioned earlier, PHAs and HUD staffs were ill-equipped to administer the program and compute contract rents properly. We estimate that excessive housing assistance payments will approximate $58.8 million during the 15-year contract period for the projects we reviewed at 20 PHAs. Should our test results be an indication of the conditions at other projects funded over the past five years, the potential excess assistance payments could total over $413 million for the remaining contract terms. Moreover, in terms of program integrity, HUD staff as well as PHA officials have little confidence that the program was administered in an economical, effective, or efficient manner. While the audit was in process, we began an investigation because of indications that the allocation process for the program was not competitive and that a strong perception of favoritism existed. This was based on the apparent allocation of units to specific projects or developers, some of whom were former HUD employees, the payment of substantial fees up to $1,500 per unit by developers to consultants, including former HUD employees, for assistance in obtaining the units, the apparent access to inside information by former employees, and the contributions by participant in HUD programs to a charitable organization supported by Thomas Demery, then Assistant Secretary for Housing, FHA Commissioner. Developers, consultants, and PHA employees were interviewed concerning projects that were awarded funds. We subpoenaed records and interviewed those who agreed to meet with us. We were unable to interview certain former employees who declined to be interviewed. I would like to point out that we cannot compel someone to be interviewed. Our investigation disclosed a definite perception that favoritism existed in the allocation process. Contributing to this perception were frequent instances where the number of units awarded coincided with a specific number of units proposed by certain developers. For example, there were 312 units awarded to the Maryland Department of Economic and Community Development, which was the number of units proposed by Ms. Judith Siegel for Kingsley Park a project she owned in Essex, Maryland. Although Ms. Siegel also participated in the program as a consultant to other developers, she retained James Watt, former Secretary of Interior, and paid him $300,000 to act as her consultant on Kingsley Park. Another example was the award... Could I, could I stop you on that just for a second? On the basis of your investigation, what was the nature of Mr. Watt's consultation on that project? According to Mr. Watt, when he was interviewed, that his role was to facilitate uh, contacts with HUD officials to convince them that this was an appropriate project. What does that mean in English? Whom did he talk to? How many times? For how long? 
He was not definitive in <coughs> the, the depth of the work he did, only to say that uh, he believes he did speak with Secretary Pierce at some point. Your testimony is that former Secretary of the Interior, what, spoke on the telephone or in person? I'm not sure that point was clarified in the interview with him, sir. Either on the telephone or in person, Mr. Watts spoke with Mr. Pierce. Whom else did he speak to? He did not identify other parties. What uh, is your impression or the impression of the investigator? How many contacts were involved between Mr. Watt and HUD on this matter? He did not enumerate those, and we have no basis of determining those, sir. What is your impression? Was it a, a time-consuming consultancy over a protracted period of time? Does not appear to have been that way, sir. It appears more like what? A minimal amount of contact. Some telephone calls? Or maybe just one telephone call? We only know that he says he contacted some HUD officials and he only recalls contact specifically the secretary was the only person he recalled having spoken. And what was the consulting fee received by Mr. Watt? $300,000, sir. Was the project successful? Yes, what, sir, it was. In the sense that they got the units? It, it was, sir. Please proceed. Thank you. Another example was the award of 160 units to the Clark County Housing Authority of Las Vegas, Nevada. Philip Abrams, former Assistant Secretary for Housing and former Undersecretary, wrote a letter on May the 10th, 1986, to Ms. Deborah G. Dean, then Assistant, excuse me, then Executive Assistant to the Secretary, which asked that the Clark County be funded, 100, awarded 160 units. On May 22, 1986, HUD allocated 160 units to Clark County, who in turn awarded the 160 units to Sierra Point Apartments, a project which was developed by Wynn Associates, a company in which Mr. Abrams had an interest. Our interview of HUD, of Public Housing Authority officials and others indicate that it was their perception that developers were being awarded units as a result of fees paid to consultants, including Joseph Strauss, former special assistant to the secretary who received over $1.3 million, Gerald Kisner, former deputy general counsel who received $282,500, and Michael Karam, former deputy assistant secretary for multifamily housing who received $420,000. We also found instances where developers received information about the allocation of units before the PHAs were notified. For example, Mr. J. Michael Queenan, a former director of housing development of the HUD Regional Office in Denver, advised the director of the Richland Washington Housing Authority of the award of units even before the Seattle Regional Office of HUD was notified by HUD headquarters. In Florida, we found evidence that developers and owners were receiving information on unit allocations to PHAs even before notification to the PHAs themselves. Such information included copies of memoranda from Mr. Demery to the regional administrators detailing the allocation of units as well as the HUD forms assigning funding and contract authority to the PHAs. Information was developed during the audit indicating that a developer contributed to Food for Africa a charitable organization listed in Mr. Demery's financial disclosure statement for which he served in an official capacity since 1985. While we found no reason to question the stated purpose of food, we identified contributions totaling $290,554 that were made to food by participants in HUD programs between January 1986 and 1988. This amount represents 50% of the funds raised during the same period. We were able to determine that Mr. Demery attended most of the fundraising events and made introductory remarks at some of the functions he attended. The events were sponsored by various individuals and companies, including certain participants in HUD programs, such as Michael Karam and J. Michael Queenan. 
Contributions to food included $36,000 from Mr. Queenan, $15,000 from Joseph Strauss, $19,000 from Benton Mortgage Company, a co-insurance mortgagee on approximately 45 mod rehab projects, and $27,000 from Real Property Services Corporation, a major participant in HUD projects. On November 21st, 1988, I provided preliminary information on our investigation to Mr. J. Michael Dorsey, then General Counsel, for a preliminary opinion on possible standards of conduct violations. Mr. Dorsey responded on December the 12th that no violations had occurred. As I stated earlier, our report of investigation is still under review by the Public Integrity Section of the Department of Justice. Secretary Kemp has taken an active interest in our office and met with me immediately upon arriving at HUD to learn firsthand of significant ongoing audits and investigations. I provided him details of these efforts at that time. He and his staff have responded quickly and positively to our reports. Secretary Kemp sent memorandum to top program managers in the field and headquarters that summarized the problems we identified and explained his commitment to taking corrective actions. On April 26, 1989, Secretary Kemp announced a series of actions he took to assure that HUD funds benefit the most deserving recipients. More specifically, he announced all FY89 funding selections were canceled for those PHAs that did not yet execute an annual contribution contract. A new selection process will be developed by the Office of Housing and will be used to reallocate the canceled FY89 funds. Over 300 projects funded during the audit period will be reviewed by HUD staff to determine if the projects were selected properly and the rent rates were computed accurately. The Office of General Counsel will review the existing rules and laws to determine whether new regulations are needed to govern HUD employees' involvements in the funding process. This review will also define prohibited conduct by recipients of HUD grants, loans, subsidies, and other programs. I am confident that his personal commitment to strengthen the program effectiveness will significantly improve the economy and efficiency of the program and restore public confidence in program integrity. We look forward to working closely with Secretary Kemp in this regard. Thank you. This concludes my remarks, and I will be pleased to respond to any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Adams. Are any of your associates uh, prepared to make an opening statement, or they will just respond to questions? Just respond along to questions. With you? Very good. What is the function of the Inspector General within HUD? The Office of Inspector General is charged with the oversight of all the HUD programs and activities and personnel of the department to assure that the programs are discharged in an effective and economical way. Did you have any personal animosity or dislike for any of the people who are uh, cast in an unfavorable light by your report? None whatsoever, sir. So you are testifying under oath that this report is your best objective appraisal of uh, deficiencies and flaws and possible illegalities in this program. That's correct, sir. Your report points to some very serious abuses at HUD uh, under Secretary Pierce. Uh, could you tell us, Mr. Adams, how long did you and your staff spend so far, thus far, on, in, on investigating this, this whole issue. How comprehensive has it been? How much uh, in the way of resources has this investigation absorbed? It began early in 1988, sir, and to date we've expended 15 and a half staff years of audit time and about two and a half years of investigative time in the pursuit of this. Would you consider this as one of your major investigations? Yes, sir. You indicate in your testimony that there are 10 additional reports in process. What do those deal with? With the activities of 10 additional public housing authorities and projects that were funded at those localities. During the conduct of this investigation, Mr. Adams, how easy was it for you to find records of how funding decisions were made? For the period through May of 1988, there was little, if any, documentation concerning the funding decisions that were made. 
What was your reaction to this total lack of the paper trail? We believe that the decision-making process should always be documented and that uh, that serves as the basis for a later um, review of the process and any criticism and justification that's needed for the uh, decisions that are made. Was this extraordinary from your point of view that uh, decisions that clearly impacted to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars on the financial well-being of individual developers, consultants, uh, and, and the communities affected or disfavored should have no paper trail? The impact uh, at the HUD level is only to the public housing authorities. Um, I might back up and clarify one point if I might, Mr. Chairman. Please. Uh, in addition to the difficulty in obtaining information concerning the defunding decisions that were made, uh, there was a, an absence of any information concerning the parties that were involved in the process at the PHA level, which required us to submit a questionnaire to all the public housing authorities receiving more than 25 units, asking them to provide us the information, which uh, includes the identity of the contractors, of the consultants, or other parties that were involved in the process. It was through the use of that information that we were more able to more target our efforts by looking at the people that were involved. Let me play out a very simple scenario for you. Uh, let me assume that I represent the Public Housing Authority, which by any set of objective criteria ought to receive um, some consideration in this program. But I'm not wise enough to get a consultant um, who has entree to HUD. So I merely send in a letter, which I also want to deal with because I understand that the applications were not complex applications that would have given the evaluating body a basis for determining relative need, but they were letters. Some of them we have in the file, one-page letters saying, please allocate units to us. Well, I'm one of these needy but unsophisticated public housing authorities. And, and I send in my letter, and I don't get anything. And there is another instance where a developer gets together with a so-called consultant who gets an allocation of 158 units, and the public housing authority and I stipulate with far less need for this, gets the money. Is this basically the scenario that you see in many instances here? That's correct, sir. So need of children and families in dire need of uh, public housing is ignored while public housing authorities in instances where there is a well-connected consultant receive allocation. Is this a fair characterization? Yes, sir. In your report, uh, Mr. Adams, you state that these abuses may cost the taxpayer as much as $413 million. That's a very big figure, even in this day and age. Can you tell us how you arrived at that figure? That was based on the audit work we performed at 20 public housing authorities involving 43 projects. Based on that, we determined that our estimate was it was $58.8 million at those locations. Assuming that similar conditions exist in the remaining units that were awarded, then that could lead to a, a overpaid assistance of uh, $413 million. So let me be sure I understand you. you in fact studied a number of projects and you came to the conclusion that the taxpayer was obligated by HUD to overpay $58 million and then you extrapolated that to the total number of awards and arrived at $413 million. That's the process. That's correct, sir. Now in your selection of the initial sample, could anybody find any attempt to bias that sample? Did you, did you select those initial projects at random? That selection process was not at random, sir. I'll acknowledge that. 
the process was that we looked at projects where he, we had received uh, allegations in some situations. Some was based on the volume of activity that people were involved in. It, so it was not a random sample, sir. But you have no reason to believe that the overpayment would be less in the rest of the projects? No, sir. Would you characterize your $413 million estimate as conservative or, or inflated? Conservative, I would say, sir. Conservative. So the $413 million may not, in fact, fully reflect the overpayment. It may not, sir. As the department goes about uh, resolving our audit findings, those figures could be re adjusted either upward or downward. I'm sorry? Those figures could be adjusted upward or downward as we proceed with the resolution of those audit findings we had on those initial 43 projects even. But your present judgment is that your $413 million estimate is realistic or even conservative? It's realistic, sir. It's realistic. I want to deal with the question of consultants. Um, in many, many areas, I think consultants have a very legitimate function to perform. Consultants presumably are specialists who know the ins and outs of how programs uh, operate um, and um, it is appropriate to, to hire them if one wants to, wants to obtain the results. As I read your report, all 700 pages of it, one of the most striking things about your report is that the application was an unbelievably simple application. You basically were told, if you were a public housing authority, submit a letter and tell us what you need. And I read a number of these, and these are simple letters. Some have attachments which indicate um, standard items, but basically I have difficulty seeing what need the typical public housing authority would have for, quote unquote, a consultant. Can you enlighten us on that? One point of clarification, Mr. Chairman. The consultants were not employed by the public housing authority. They were employed by the developers or that owners is of correct. the correct. Okay. Um, it seems to me that the application process, at least up until May of 1988, uh, was rather simple and straightforward, and I don't perceive a need at that stage for a consultant. So your point is that had the public housing authorities just sent in their applications, had there been an objectively measurable selection process both at the regional level and at, um, at uh, the central level here in Washington, there would have been no need for consultants. At that stage, you're correct, sir. So your view of the role of the consultant was really not one of providing technical expertise, but of providing inside information, privileged information, special access to the individuals who made the decisions? Yes, sir. That's correct. Would it be more appropriate to view this as influence peddling rather than consulting in the legitimate uh, context of the term? There are consultants in this city who that's their role in life is to facilitate meetings and contacts. Um, some people might characterize it as influence peddling. Well, would it be fair to say that the value of the consultant was not just what he or she knew, or principally what he or she knew, but principally what he or whom he or she knew? I believe that's correct, sir. Some of the consultants acknowledged that when interviewed by us. Can you give us examples of that? I believe uh, James Watt and uh, Rick Shelby are two that quickly come to mind. They indicated that uh, they had little, if any, no knowledge of the program and their role was to facilitate meetings and contacts with people in Washington to convince them that these were worthwhile projects. Well, since only a tiny fraction of the projects that were in need of assistance were funded, 
On what basis could Mr. Watt, for instance, persuade the secretary that on a comparative scale, the project pushed or lubricated by, by Mr. Watt was more worthy of uh, funding than another project in another part of the country? Was there any objective basis for making that judgment? I have no, no knowledge of that, sir. I'm sorry? I have no knowledge as to what that might have been. Well, what is your judgment? What's your view? I can, I can find no basis other than the fact that he's making a contact with someone to, to say this is a worthwhile project that should be considered. So in sum, do you believe that consultants were paid for bona fide services rendered, actual services rendered, technical advice? Or were they paid more for providing privileged insider information that was not otherwise publicly available or for special contacts, pre-existing contacts? I think we have a combination of, combination of both those situations if we rely upon the information provided by the consultants themselves as they characterize their services. And we have no independent basis of judging really what they did or did not do. We have to rely totally upon their assertions and the information provided by those that employed them. It was the perception of many of those that employed the consultants that that's what they were getting. They were getting access to people. I know you may not have uh, statistics at your fingertip, but what would be your estimate of the average income of individuals or families living in one of these units? I'm a little bit of a loss. I would estimate probably $20,000 or less. These are low-income individuals. That's correct. So a $300,000 consulting fee for couple of telephone calls maybe could represent as much as 15 years of earnings for one of these families that Congress was trying to help with housing. Is that accurate? That's correct. In your report, Mr. Adams, you describe how some developers had access to internal HUD HUD documents dealing with the ongoing funding process. Uh, can you give us some examples of, of this, where the developer had uh, access to internal HUD documents? Yes, sir. Uh, we found a situation in uh, the Dade County Housing Authority in Miami, Florida, in which the rehabilitation finance supervisor provided us copies of memoranda three different memoranda from Mr. Demery to the regional administrator, which basically set forth the funding allocations for certain periods of time. Uh, he reported to us that those documents were delivered to him. I'll provide you uh, by one of the developers who told him, or her, excuse me, sir, that 190 of the units were for projects, his projects, and the remaining units were for another developer. And this was prior to receipt of official notification by the department to that locality. In a similar situation, uh, and in fact, all three examples track very much the same situation, just to cover different periods of time. Mr. Adams, uh, I, I will ask only one final question on this round because I'm uh, anxious to give my colleagues an opportunity to take as much time as they choose. Uh, let me also ask you at this stage and your colleagues that you stay in the hearing room until the conclusion of the hearing because we may want to have you return following additional testimony. Um, on page 10 of your uh, prepared statement, you make the following observation, paragraph 3. Developers, consultants, and PHA employees were interviewed concerning projects that were awarded program units. This was combined with our efforts to gather information and contributions to the charitable organization, as well as fees paid to former HUD employees for consulting work. We subpoenaed records and interviewed those who agreed to meet with us. We were unable to interview certain former employees who declined to be interviewed. I would like to point out that we cannot compel someone to be interviewed. 
We, of course, know that, and, uh, and we are very conscious of, uh, of this uh, limitation on your capability of, uh, of uh, completing the job. Uh, and this is why it is so important in, in the view of, uh, of uh, this subcommittee for the Inspector General's office um, to do the initial work and for a duly constituted um, Committee of Congress to go on with the work because we do have subpoena powers. Will you submit uh, to the subcommittee the list of individuals whom you chose to interview, wh whom you sought to interview, but who declined to be interviewed? We will do so, sir. Uh, it will be the intention of the subcommittee to invite those <coughs> individuals, as indeed we have invited already a number of others, and where we uh, will also be declined, uh, uh, we will issue subpoenas. I want to thank you, Mr. Adams, and your colleagues, and I'd like now to turn to Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Adams, I'd like to direct your attention to the uh, last paragraph on page six of your statement. I think uh, because of the placement of a semicolon, there may be a wrong meaning conveyed. I'd like to clear it up. You said that based on audit results, we concluded there is little assurance that housing is being provided to those areas having the greatest needs, semicolon, and that limited program funds are being spent efficiently and effectively. And did you mean to convey that, in fact, limited program funds are being spent efficiently and effectively, or that there is little assurance that There's limited program? There's little assurance that, sir. I stand corrected. OK. On uh, page 8 of your, uh, your statement, you talked about uh, lobbying that was done by consultants. Um, and concluded that these conditions demonstrate the absence of the type of op open competition at the PHA level intended in HUD regulations. Now, a series of, of questions. First of all, is there anything about lobbying or contacting uh, HUD officials or PHA officials that is per se against a regulation or law? No, sir. Uh, could it have been done? Uh, in a way that might be illegal, except for an obvious payoff kind of a situation. In the situation of former governmental employees, there are the uh, post-employment conflict of uh, interest um, restrictions. We did not find any evidence of that having been violated, though, sir. Okay. Um, now let's turn to the competitive process. You suggest here that there are HUD regulations presumably that require some kind of competitive process. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Is that for the award of any contract or just certain kinds of contracts? We're talking about specifically the mod rehab contracts in this situation. And sir. they are required to be competitively bid. That's correct. So it would, it would, one would presume that um, if the decision were made to uh, make a certain award based upon influence or lobbying rather than upon the competitive process, that a regulation would have been violated. Is that correct? That's correct. Might a law also have been violated, or would it probably just be a regulation? <coughs> I don't perceive any violation of law at this point, sir. All right, but regulations might have been violated if the decision were based upon something other than the competitive process. Correct. OK. Now, is there a procedure for pursuing that possibility, a legal procedure? <coughs> <laughs> I don't perceive one, Mr. Kyle. So it, I it, would defer to counsel on that particular issue, but I, I just. It may be one of those uh, laws where conduct is, is required or proscribed, but there's no uh, specific way to enforce the law. Well, let me try, try to explain my understanding. The, the competition should be at the po public housing authority level, and they should go out and seek out the developers and owners to participate in the program. They are supposed to have in place an administrative plan, which is approved by the department, which prescribes that process. Um, 
after the contract has been awarded, I'm not sure what you could do to turn that process over. I think that's what Secretary Kemp did when he withdrew those funds that have been allocated already. He eliminated the possibility of those going forward, and he's reallocating those to assure that the administrative process does work properly. But I'm not sure what relief is available if the project has already been awarded at that point. What sanctions you could bring, I'm not aware. There could be remedial action to prevent the uh, improper expenditure of funds, but as far as punishment of individuals is concerned, you're, you're not aware specifically of what might be done. No, sir. Unless we could find that it might rise to the level that they should be debarred or suspended from future participation in the program, but uh, we don't, we've not uh, perceived anything at that level yet. Well, if, if uh, through your efforts and turning the information over to the appropriate law enforcement agencies that were determined that there were a quid pro quo, that is to say that a person involved in the decision-making process made a decision based upon criteria other than the competitive bidding process, then there might be something that, that would be done from a law enforcement point of view. Is that right? That's correct, sir. Okay. And that has been turned over to the appropriate officials, and we'll just have to wait and see on that. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Um, you talked about uh, the... Um, estimate of excessive housing assistant payments of 58 plus million dollars. Now what do you mean by excessive payments? As our audit staff went through looking at the individual projects, they found, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, that there was little if any oversight at the PHA or the HUD field office level, and therefore some of the amounts of subsidies had been computed to be excessive, and those should be disallowed and are recaptured if they'd already been paid. In other words, under the formula for either rehabilitating or providing the, the, the subsidy, uh, there's a certain amount of money that's appropriate in any given situation, and if you pay the developer or, or, a, or the PHA a larger subsidy, uh, or the developer more money than, than permitted by the formula, there is an excessive, an overpayment, is that correct? That's correct. And that's what you estimate occurred here. may have here. included an eligible cost or other factors that should not have been part of the cost of the subsidy, and that okay. should be withdrawn. Now, uh, I, I don't want to quibble about this, but just to follow a line of questioning of the chairman to be real sure, you obviously looked into uh, potential problems, not, uh, you, you, you didn't go out and pick a random sample and take a look at it, you went after those situations that somebody tipped you off might uh, suggest a problem, is that correct? The sample that we looked at the, the bias there was only towards the allocation process. We had no other indications of irregularities as we started in to look at the individual projects. I don't understand. That. Well, as we chose projects to look at, we were looking initially at the allocation process. If there was a bias, it occurred at that level, not at the other levels. The allocations by the department, the housing authorities. We had no prior indications, for instance, that there were excessive rents on the projects we selected. Well. I want to be real sure, because uh, if, if we're going to proceed uh, with a certain number, we need to have confidence in, in the number. And uh, le le let me tell you what I thought might be the case, and then we'll work backward from that. Um, if you went to projects that involved excessive payments, uh, it would stand a reason you went to those situations that you were tipped off on might, might present a problem. And I understood your testimony in response to the chairman to be that 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 in those uh, approximately one-eighth of, uh, of the projects, you found $58 million in potential overpayments. You then extrapolated to the entire percentage of, of programs and came out with the figure of uh, $413 million. But there did not seem to me to be any suggestion that uh, um, you had any evidence that in, in any of those programs there might have been something wrong, whereas you did have evidence in the, in the case of the $58 million that you found. Now, that's what it kind of seemed to come out as. Could you correct us if that's incorrect? No. I March believe that's back a, through it. A, an accurate portrayal. Just one point of clarification. In our original selection of projects to look at, we were looking only at the allocation process. Then we began to look at the excess assistance. So if there was a bias on the process, it was in the allocation, not in the disclosure of excess assistance payments. That's the point I was trying to clarify. I well, hope that clarifies it for you. Well, it, it not, not quite. What, what I want to get at is this. Um, uh, you found some definite problems, and you're estimating with the sample you looked at, $58 million. That's a lot of money uh, in and of itself. But to go to the $400 uh, million, you would have to assume that the same conditions existed with respect to the rest of the projects as existed with respect to these first 20. 
And uh, you had specific evidence with respect to these first 20 <coughs> that there might be something wrong. You pursued it, found out that in many cases there, there was. My question is, did you have or do you have any evidence that there might be something wrong with respect to the rest of them? And can you, in fact, make that extrapolation as you have done? We have no specific evidence that that same conditions are true in the other projects, sir. You're correct. And it would stand to reason that if, if there were a problem, and apparently this problem was sort of widespread around the country in terms of people coming to you with, with uh, tips or concerns, is that correct? Correct. So, so presumably uh, everyone had an opportunity to, to come forward and, and suggest the problems to you. So what I'm getting at here is that maybe uh, before we rely too much on this $413 million figure, um, it would be worthwhile to go back and take a look at it from the perspective that I'm talking about right now and determine whether you really can make that extrapolation. That's one of the commitments the Secretary has made to look at those 300 projects and that will be part of that process. Right. In other words, uh, th th there's enough of a problem here without uh, being uh, inaccurate in the, in the uh, uh, extrapolations uh, and, and so we don't want to be inaccurate. Um, With regard to the apparent access to inside information, uh, can you determine or can you tell us if there are any potential violations of law or regulation in this? In other words, it's not a good thing uh, if there is inside information given to someone with which they can uh, then uh, obtain some kind of a contract or award improperly. There's, there's a suggestion here that there's something wrong with it, but I, but I haven't seen it carried to the logical conclusion. Is, is there, in fact, uh, a, a regulation that might have been violated, and B, can you s s point to any situation where it appears that the contract was awarded because of the inside information? On the question of violation of law or regulations, we identified no laws nor regulations which we believe were violated by the disclosure of the information. And your B part of your question, I've forgotten, sir. I've well, it, it appears that, that the inside information was, was the determination of the department that, in fact, a specific award had been made. Certain housing units were going to get, or a certain developer was, excuse me, a certain PHA was going to get a certain number of units supported and so on. That's, that's after the fact information, right? Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm having a hard time figuring out, uh, I mean, it, it may not be proper form, and certainly it ought not to be done, but I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out what was really inherently wrong with it. The more common practice was was a developer would approach a public housing authority and suggest that if that public housing agency would deal with them, then that public housing agency would get units. Uh, in instances, we identified the public housing authority then received an allocation from the department in an amount which corresponded with the number of units of that developer. Therefore, the public housing authority believed that that developer did have the inside information in the process. They were told at such times as that we have 300 units set aside for us, and if you deal with us, you will get. Okay. But did you uncover any evidence to back up any of those suggestions? That's different from the inside information, the three examples that you gave, gave to us. No documentary. I'm sorry. Mr. Tucker, like to... We developed no documentary evidence of that. Uh, it's basically, the individuals were contacting the public housing authorities and communicating with them uh, what they could do for them, and then the subsequent events reinforced that perception. Yeah, it it, it looks fishy. I I, I readily uh, concede that. You but understand my frustration in trying to do the investigation. And so okay, <laughs> that, I, and and that that's the that, that's what I want to nail down. We're talking about two things. You have documented some inside information that that you can't point to having had any effect because it's after the fact inside information, correct? Correct. But you also have a, have a situation that just doesn't look right because uh, it appeared that an award matched what a, what a developer said he could do for someone before the fact. Correct. But you haven't been able to tie the two together in any way yet. I would have one other comes to recall, uh, Mr. Kyle, if mm -hmm. I might share with you. Sure. There was a situation in which uh, guidance was issued to the regional office by the Assistant Secretary on March the 25th of last year. On March the 30th, and I hope my staff will correct me if I'm giving you a bad date here, um, 
we are told by the director of a public housing authority that he received a copy of that same document from a developer. And that d document was giving guidance to the regional office and identifying public housing authorities that would be invited to request funding during that forthcoming funding round. Once again, uh, leading to the perception by that housing authority, as well as we believe others, that that person or other persons enjoyed some special entree to the department. And, and that's, a, that's an example where there theoretically, anyway, could have, have been some inside information that resulted in the award of the contract in that, in that case. I mean, that's, that's a before the fact, or potential before the fact. That's correct. Um, finally, uh, I think finally, with regard to these um, contributions to charity, uh, uh, I, I think that that's a, a, a very legitimate and worthwhile charity. Um, and, and I'm wondering here what the, um, what the quid pro quo might have been. In other words, uh, again, it's, it looks a little strange that all these people who got the awards just happened to contribute to the favorite charity of someone involved in making the award. Uh, do you have anything else to, to present to us that would suggest uh, an impropriety? No, sir. I, could, I agree with you, and it was my concern throughout the process as we began this that we were confronted with this issue and we no way intended to any way detract from the stated purpose of the charity or to any way demean the charity. It was a uh, mere fact it was brought to our attention during the course of the investigation and we felt it had to be pursued. I mean, it, it's possible that the only quid pro quo was that it made this particular individual look good if he could raise a lot of money for his charity. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Uh, you, you don't have anything more than that? No, sir. In any event to present to us? Okay. Well, I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Congressman Kyle. Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Adams. I've got a big problem with the developer telling the public housing authority to apply for a grant and uh, describe exactly what was available and find that's exactly what happened. And uh, uh, I've got a, a big problem with a lot of what I've heard today and a lot of what I've read. It strikes me that deregulation is clearly in vogue. We need more freedom. Uh, a lot less paperwork. I mean, that's the whole argument. But it strikes me that if that's the way we think, that should I be impressed with a statement that says, you know, we found no laws broken, no regulations broken, when in fact it appears that we don't have laws to deal with us and we don't have regulations to deal with us. Uh, I mean, isn't that one of your findings in a sense, that we allowed this to happen because we aren't regulating it properly? I believe your assessment's correct, sir. And it strikes me that if we don't have regulations, what we then have to depend on is the ethical morality of, uh, of those individuals who are in charge of these programs. Is that not correct? That's correct, sir. So we're faced with a decision now of, of seeing a lot of stuff that stinks, uh, but being able to say, well, no regulations were broken, no laws were broken. And acting like, well, then everything's okay. I mean, it seems to me that's kind of the defense of some who have uh, been brought up in your reports as saying, well, fortunately, no regulations were broken, no, no laws were broken. But in fact, a lot of stuff happened that wasn't right. Are you going to be making recommendations to us on specific laws or regulations that we may need to, um, to promulgate? I recommended to the Secretary when I sent him the report that he consider recommending to the Congress a piece of legislation on consultants which would somewhat parallel that and recently passed for the Department of Defense where there at least had to be public disclosure of their involvement. I know you've described it in some detail, but I'd like you to, as succinctly as possible, explain to me what you mean in a sense that, that uh, some of these decisions were headquarter driven. I mean, that's not exactly your, your terminology, but, but do you know what I'm describing? It, it, you seem to, in your 800-page, 700-page report and, and in this statement here, allude to the fact that a lot of decisions were made at headquarters. What does that really mean? I mean, what, what's the impact of that? Basically, all the decisions as to the allocations were made at headquarters because with the waiver of uh, the 213 requirement for fair share, then it became a discretionary process and the applications flowed up to headquarters and the decisions were being made at headquarters. Uh, during, up until May of 1988, that was made with uh, limited documentation. 
And then we had interjected the role of the consultants and others who were making contact at the headquarters level, and it grew more and more to be a perceive, perception that uh, all the decisions were being made at headquarters in many instances because of the match between a particular developer's project, the numbers of the units, that even those decisions were being made at headquarters as to the specific projects to be funded. In the state of Connecticut, we have a process where we go to Hartford. We have the Hartford office. It goes up to Boston. We have the regional office. And then it, it, it might come down to Washington. But it seems to me you're describing, therefore, a situation that really bypasses Hartford. It bypasses Boston pretty much and goes directly to a few key individuals in Washington. Is that correct? That was correct up until May of 1988, sir. This is a kind of a parenthetical, but it just makes me wonder if you could have a program so screwed up and so dependent on the ethics of individuals who, when they may come to decisions that seem to favor people, say there's no regulation or law, so I'm without sin. Um, it makes me wonder if other programs, like the Section 202 Direct Loan Fund, is handled the same way. In other words, is it likely that this may just be one example of many examples in HUD where it goes directly to, to Washington and bypasses and special people get... Many of the other programs have a more structured process which they uh, use to make the funding decisions. And I believe, uh, as an example of that, one of the considerations presently being uh, uh, taken is to use something similar to what's done with the HODAGs uh, as a prospective way to fund uh, the Section 8. And I'm sure that 202 does have a much more structured process in allocating the funds. So, mm. so it would be your testimony, though, that we have, we have other models to look at. In other words, there, there are other programs that HUD does that you think um, follow a more uh, established procedure uh, that this program could have been modeled after. Correct. And I think those are, those are being considered now as part of the decision making on how to do the future funding. So those individuals who, who may have been involved in this program, when they said and have said, well, we were looking to have some regulation and really we reached out and called for people to establish a process, didn't really have to look very far. They could have just looked at other programs that exist at HUD. That's correct. Um, I'm interested in, a, in the point when you talk about in your statement that some people refuse to testify. Um, this, I'm a new member, and so I've got a lot to learn here. Uh, you do not have the power to subpoena. Subpoena records, not witnesses, sir. Okay. So a committee like ours becomes more, you, you depend in some cases on the work that we're able to do because we, in fact, can subpoena witnesses. <clears throat> That's correct, sir. Um, when you come to a conclusion that you found no proof of illegality or, or regulations that were broken, aside from the fact that it's maybe meaningless since there was no regulation really established which could have been broken in the first place, um, it also raises the question in my mind that the lack of proof may have been uh, clearly that you simply didn't have access to the people you needed to, 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 to have come before you. Is that, is that not true? That's possible, sir. Would you give me an idea in terms of a percentage? Uh, were you able to get at 90% of those, uh, I mean not get at, but able to interview 90% of those that you needed to? Or, or were there, in terms of some key personnel, key people, in order to put this puzzle together, uh, did you have access to 90% of them or, or less? I would say 90% would probably be a good guess. I would also point out, though, uh, Mr. Shays, that even if they granted us uh, an interview, uh, they're under no compulsion to provide us testimony. They could uh, answer those questions, they, or they could provide self-serving statements. Um. You know, one of the sad things, I think, that could occur from something like this is just the confirmation that, regrettably, some people can't be trusted to be ethical, and the end result is you have to have regulation which results in a lot more paperwork, all the things we don't want to have in government. But if the defense of individuals is that we need these regulations in order to hold me to that standard, it's a pretty sad commentary on our society. I share your concern that we not overregulate ourselves, and we're often accused as auditors and investigators of wanting to have things too structured and too documented, but uh, I think we have to try to achieve a balance someplace in that process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Um, I just have one question and again would like to repeat my request that you stay in the, 
in the uh, hearing room until we are completed. Uh, one of the former HUD officials, as part of his consultancy, received $50,000, a 15% share of the equity of the project, and 15% of the annual federal subsidies to the project. Is that correct? I believe the latter is 15% of the cash flow of the project. That's correct, sir. 15% of the cash flow of the project. Part of the cash flow of the project was federal subsidies. Correct, sir. Are federal subsidies designed to provide income to consultants, or are federal subsidies designed to make it possible for people of low income to pay the rent in these units? The stated intent is to subsidize the rental of the unit for the tenant. <laughs> Did the Congress at any time contemplate that federal rent subsidies will be used to pay quote unquote consultants? Not to my knowledge, sir. Does HUD internally expect to be paying consultants out of rent subsidies? I don't believe so, sir. Well, I certainly don't either, and I am sure that not, uh, not one of my colleagues in the Congress uh, uh, would, would stomach this. Uh, a number of your answers, and I want to commend you, Mr. Adams, for the work you have done as well as your, as well as your associates. We, we have found you to be cooperative, and I think you have done a, a very useful public service, which is the function of the Inspector General. So I want to commend you, and, as well as your staff. But I want to deal with this question, which you keep answering to Congressman Shays and me. And technically, I suspect you may be correct that there was no violation of law. Um, well, if there are no laws against certain things, then technically there is no violation of law. I am unaware of a law that um, prevents the President of the United States from selling White House tickets to visitors. There is no such a law, to the best of my knowledge, because nobody in his right mind contemplates that any president would engage in such a reprehensible and shady and shabby practice. Uh, so if a president, a future president, in a moment of temporary insanity would start selling these White House tickets, he would not be guilty of any violation of law, but he would be swept out of office, would he not? Because there would be an outrage uh, overcoming the Congress and the country and says, this is the people's house, you're, you're, you're just a temporary resident, and people should be given tickets on a first-come, first-served basis, and at no cost. Well, isn't this analogous to what we are dealing with here? And, and I feel that that while technically laws may not have been violated, and I'm not nearly as sure of this as you seem, there is a fundamental undermining of the very purpose of an important congressional initiative, namely to help people of very low incomes in these outrageously high housing cost periods to at least live in publicly assisted housing by rehabilitating these and by providing a subsidy. So if in fact there are no laws that anybody violated, there certainly ought to be laws and there ought to be regulations because uh, uh, the abuses are palpable. Uh, and there is no doubt in my mind that the American people, when they become aware of these outrageous practices of a couple of telephone calls yielding a $300,000 consulting fee to a former Secretary of the Interior, um, for talking to the former Secretary of Housing, uh, this is a <coughs> an, in, an unacceptable pattern of behavior. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. Well, uh, is there any additional comment you would like to make, Mr. Adams? Uh, you have another question. Yes, Congressman Chase has another I just want to establish for the record and, and, and for my own clarity, when the consultants received um, their fee, 
uh, I can make the assumption that their fee ultimately was incorporated in the, in the cost of the project. Is that correct? It may have been. It's not supposed to be, Mr. Shays. It's not an eligible project cost. Uh, but but in, dollars are fungible, are they not? And if the, if the project was lucrative enough, then they could have written that check out of another pot, but it was still paid for by the project, meaning the taxpayer. That's correct. Just a point of clarification for Mr. Shays. Uh, consultant fees are not an eligible project cost, and I think that's another indication that the government did not perceive a role for the consultant in the process. Otherwise, they would have probably have made them an eligible project. Yeah, I'd like to emphasize that point. Uh, could you just say it one more time? That consultant fees are not an eligible project cost. And that's why what? That's another reason I believe the government didn't perceive a need for it. Otherwise, they would have made those eligible. Okay. Uh, and in response to the second question that my chairman asked, um, you're saying to us in one instance, clearly, uh, one of these consultants had a financial interest in the project and uh, is due to receive whatever cash flow comes from it, uh, monies from this project over a long period of time. That's the provisions of this contract. That's okay. correct, sir. That's including our reported and investigation. And that is not illegal? No, sir. So you just call it a different thing. <laughs> you give them ownership. I would just <laughs> remind the committee that... Uh, the ultimate decision with respect to the uh, violations is the responsibility of the Department of Justice, and they are still reviewing the okay. report. And we'll be glad to assist them in any way that they feel appropriate. Thank you for your good work. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and I appreciate your staying. Our next uh, witness is uh, former Assistant Secretary for Housing, Mr. Thomas Demery. <coughs> Mr. Demery, we are pleased to have you. Please stand and raise your right hand. <coughs> do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please be seated. Thank you. Mr. Demery, you are accompanied by counsel. Yes, I am. Uh, Would you care to identify him? His name is Jarris Leonard. Mr. Jerry Leonard. Uh, Ms. Demery, we are pleased to have you. Your, uh, you submitted to the committee an initial statement and a supplemental statement, which we received this morning. Both statements will be included in the record in their entirety. You may proceed in any way you choose. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, pre I too, very much appreciate yeah, I would also like to, if I, forgive me for interrupting you, I would also like to, uh, for the record, indicate that you appear before this subcommittee of your own volition in response to our request. You have not been subpoenaed. You have uh, uh, welcomed the opportunity of appearing before this subcommittee, and I think the, the record should state that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been invited to several other committee appearances of your colleagues, and I uh, will happily respond uh, favorably to each and every invitation to this discuss. This is a town overflowing with invitations, as you well yes. know. So. Some are better than others. Some are better than <laughs> others. Um, I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to sit before your committee today and to discuss the 700-page uh, document that the Inspector General at HUD has prepared and released for public distribution. The document has a curious title. It starts with the name Thomas T. Demery, former Assistant Secretary for Housing, FHA Commissioner, and continues on to state the Moderate, Rehab, moderate Rehabilitation Section 8 program. I received the document uh, the day after the press did, so I've got uh, one day behind them in terms of uh, being able to spend serious time with it, although I have done my best to make up for lost time since the title is rather significant to me and my family. I've spent, um, the reason for the supplemental statement, Mr. Chairman, is um, I spent a good deal of time over the weekend reviewing once again all 700 pages and trying to um, trying to understand what is written 
as it relates to the title. At this point, I think one more cord that is in the Gordian knot for you to unravel as a result of these hearings is exactly what relationship the, uh, the conclusions contained in the report have to at least one line in the title, that being my name. I say that because 75 percent of the uh, projects that were audited in this report, making up the bulk of the 700 pages, were funded before Thomas T. Demery became Assistant Secretary for Housing and FHA Commissioner. I say that because the Inspector General has a statement from the Secretary's Executive Assistant who stated that for 42 of the 59 months covered by the report period that she functioned as the focal point for the moderate rehabilitation program. Yet there's barely a mention made of that focal point uh, in the 700-page report which bears my name. I say that because the IG report, as to me, shows that five of six non-HUD consultants never met with me on mod rehab or never met me at all. The IG report also shows that as to me, the, the lead title on the cover page, none of the former HUD officials ever talked to me about moderate rehab. Yet in both cases, the IG, the IG charges in the 700-page report entitled Thomas T. Demery, Moderate Rehabilitation, Section 8, that the use of consultants, quote, illustrate the circumstances causing the perception of favoritism. Mr. Chairman, these few facts, along with the many more which will be developed throughout this testimony, will raise question as to why this report was written with such personal bias directed towards me. I'll leave that answer to you. But again, as a result of my reading it over the weekend, I believe the answer to that question lies in the area of malice, negligence, a cover-up, or a combination of the three. Now I'd like to read for you my supplemental statement. As to the specific allegations contained in the report of investigation, he, he did, he said he would. I sincerely appreciate this opportunity to offer a rebuttal. I would also like to note that I've advised both the Inspector General and Secretary Pierce of the following specific refutations over six months ago, sir, when the Inspector General formally recommended removing me from the decision-making process on the basis, in his words, a perception strongly supported by circumstantial evidence and rumors. I've supplied for you um, a copy of that, of that response to the Secretary. The thesis of the report investigation is that there existed a, quote, growing perception of favoritism in the allocation of Section 8 moderate rehabilitation uni units, allegedly based on five factors. Those are contained in the cover page of the, um, of the report. How could how I could somehow be connected with this perception growing is an interesting statistical question since I was only at HUD for the last 25 percent of the decisions made. With respect to the five factors, the first one allegedly gives rise to the perception that the perception is an apparent allocation of units to specific projects or developers. As, a, as the members of this committee are no doubt aware, the Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Program does not provide assistance directly to specific projects nor to specific developers. Funding allocations are made by HUD to eligible public housing authorities. Recipient PHAs are responsible for the selection of specific projects based upon a selection process devised and administered solely by such PHA. Often letters of support from U.S. Senators, members of Congress, governors, mayors, and other public officials arrived at HUD, which made reference to specific projects. And I've attached in my supplemental statement examples from Senator Proxmire, Governor, Mar Go Governor Martin, and Senator Graham. In some cases, this was done because the project was already selected by a PHA, subject to the availability of funds making it to the PHA 
and that's been called in the trade a pipeline project, or because the PHA had already targeted a specific site or neighborhood as important to an overall plan for an area within the PHA jurisdiction, or to address a critical need such as a natural disaster. Such letters would normally receive a response which specifically stated the inability of HUD to fund individual projects. And again, I've attached a letter from Secretary Pierce dated November 1386 to Amy Schiff that states that as well as a sample letter from my Deputy Assistant Secretary Hunter Cushing to Senator Lloyd Benson where that was exemplified. Most frequently, indications of support for specific projects by senators and members of Congress were made by telephone or personally to the secretary or his executive assistant or were referred to the Office of Housing. For example, you'll see in a, in a sample phone log um, that I supplied the Inspector General, Senator Reed, and, and Congressman Thompson of the um, Appropriations Committee um, uh, excuse me, notes of telephone calls from Senator Reed and from Congressman Thompson are attached as well as a note from my uh, phone log um, in a January 6, 1989 memo. In the fiscal year 1986 MOD rehab funding, for example, prior to my tenure at HUD, support requests from Congressman Panetta, Wilson, Vidal, Nielsen, Dreyer, Reed, and Vukanovic, as well as from Senators Hawkins, Simon, Garn, and Laxalt, are documented in the FY86 MOD rehab request. It's, it's an, a supplemental attachment to the statement uh, that was prepared by HUD's Funding Control Division. More complete records of such statements of support for subsequent years were maintained at HUD and presumably still exist. This witness has never made any statement to any party that would even imply an ability on the part of HUD to favor a specific project. Accordingly, if such perception existed, it was unreasonable and certainly bore no relationship to my activities. The most obvious example of that is the story illustrated in today's Washington Post, for example, where a developer said he, had, uh, he could do all kinds of magic, and in the end, if you read the, the deposition, or excuse me, the statement from the um, Public Housing Authority, you'll see that I reacted very poorly to that kind of notification when it was conveyed to me. Where people bothered to voice to me their concerns, I acted on it in a responsible, ethical, and upright way. The second factor alleging giving rise to the perception is the receipt of substantial number of units by certain developers and owners, including several former HUD employees. Based on the report of the Inspector General, it certainly appears that a number of former HUD employees participated in projects which were selected by PHAs. However, to conclude that this was the result of an intentional effort on my part ignores the reality of the moderate rehabilitation program. As stated, in my previous remarks, the role of HUD is to make such funding available to public housing, authority, public housing authorities primarily on the basis of need. We've spoken about that already a lot this morning. During my tenure at HUD, need was defined as high numbers of low-income tenants on waiting lists, housing shortages, and regional economic depressions. I cannot speak for a system which was in place a full three years before I arrived. But starting fiscal year 1987, that's how, selection how selections were made by Tom Demery. There is no stage in the HUD decision process wherein in an evaluation of the previous employment status or track record of a person interested in some aspect of a housing proje project was made. It was never a consideration given weight by this witness. Since it was ultimately the PHA which made specific selections of owners' proposals, it would not be known to this witness whether a frequent program participant or former HUD employee was involved with the project in some or any capacity. It is well documented that the HUD Inspector General has spent a great deal of time and resources investigating the personal finances and affairs of such persons. As a class of individuals, frequent program participants, 
and former HUD employees are the most thoroughly investigated group of professionals in this country. In the subject investigation, the Inspector General used his broad powers of subpoena to obtain bank records, correspondence files, financial records, telephone records, appointment books, and other documents in w which in a criminal investigation would only be available with a grand jury subpoena. Scores of interviews, including conversations with desk clerks at hotels around this country, yielded no evidence of violations of HUD conflict of interest or ethical regulatory violations. Three, the third factor allegedly giving rise to the perception problem is the payment of substantial fees by <coughs> developers to consultants for assistance in obtaining the allocation of units. Neither Congress in promulgating statutes with respect to HUD programs nor HUD in its regulations has taken steps to limit the use of consultants and that's been sufficiently discussed already. In fact, an opinion of the Office of General Counsel specifically states that HUD does not regulate the amount or terms of contracts between a prospective Section 8 property owner and his consultant and that the Section 8 moderate rehabilitation program is designed so as to preclude the necessity for examining relationships of this type. I have attached that memo for your reading. For your reading. Other than the criminal of conflict of interest statutes, which bar certain representational activities by specifically classified former employees for a period of time, I am aware of no limitation on the use of consultants or their permitted role. To my knowledge, no such violations are alleged here. No violation is referred to in the report of investigation. Accordingly, it was never my practice to treat any program participant differently in response to whether or not they employed such persons. Whether such arrangements existed in connection with any allocations made during my tenure would not have been known to me and therefore would not have been a factor in the decision that I participated in. No evidence to the contrary is found in the report of investigation bearing my name. Four, the fourth factor alleging giving rise to the perception problem was an apparent access to inside or advance information by former employees and developers. This witness has never knowingly disseminated information to any person which would provide such person with an unfair advantage with respect to programs within the Office of Housing, specifically information of a pre-decisional nature, which is what I believe Congressman Shea was talking about as well as Mr. Kyle, was never released. However, once funding allocations are made, once the decision is made, the information is disseminated broadly within and outside HUD, uh, within and outside the Office of Housing. For example, public affairs is contacted, funding control, regional and area offices, and congressional affairs are needed to be advised of the funding decisions. Members of the Secretary's staff would request copies of technical funding documents such as rapid reply memos and HUD Form 185s which were referred to in the uh, Dade County example the Inspector General mentioned. I have attached an example of, of that um, in my supplemental statement which shows that a memorandum of Deborah Gordine to me directing funding to two PHAs and included a notation on the bottom, please send me copies of the 185. It was not, once the decision was made, it was not top secret or classified. In addition, um, the uh, Senator Thurman uh, would appreciate advance word was a note Excuse me. There was an excerpt from my telephone log of May 13, 1988, which stated that Senator Thurman would appreciate an advance word of a funding action. That was common and routine. There was a, because there was such great focus and need for housing in this country, affordable to low-income families. Many public officials, federal and local, followed this process with great interest. And finally, as, as some supporting, uh, supporting documentation, there was a note from Susan Zagami requesting a rapid reply memo from her funding control division. This process post-decision was quite public. 
<coughs> the final factor alleging giving rise to the perception problem relates to contributions to Food for Africa and my personal support of that organization. M Mr. Demery, if, if I may interrupt you at this point, you'll be perfectly happy to make whatever statement you wish to make about Food for Africa. It is the decision of the chair not to probe the issue of Food for Africa at this hearing. Uh, the reason being that uh, it, is, it is our understanding, it's a perfectly legitimate uh, charity, uh, that you personally did not benefit from any of these contributions. And while some may question the propriety of a large number of people doing business with HUD suddenly discovering this charity, uh, it is not the purpose of this hearing to deal with that. You are free to make any statement no, you wish I, on the subject. I have, I have supplied for the record a written statement, <coughs> separate written statement on Food for Africa. I have included it as part of my prepared remarks. It will be part of the record. Mr. Mr. Chairman, the only statement I do want to make please is I want to state without a shadow of a doubt that not only was there no quid pro quo until the Inspector General's report came out, I did not know who contributed what to Food for Africa. The allegation that somehow all these developers who participated not in the MOD rehab program, he was very careful the way he phrased and pumped his numbers. He included in the $290,000 he mentioned in his statement, the beginning date for those contributions included a full year before I ever came to HUD. And the program participants that made up that $290,000 was broadened way beyond the Madria program to include any housing program with which I had authority over. In addition to which, the $290,000 contains numerous errors and inaccuracies just as to classification. Mr. Chairman, this has received a lot of press. There is no doubt now, after one reporter bothered to pick up the phone and call the American ambassador in Mozambique, that Food for Africa is a worthwhile charity. The Inspector General's report casts some serious doubt on that on two separate pages with two separate interviews. But I think that issue has, in fact, now been put to, put to rest. I did not profit. I did not organize, I did not solicit, I did not discuss, I merely attended. If my attendance at a dinner that is saving lives of starving, dying children in Africa, quote, leads to a perception problem in the mind of the Inspector General, there's nothing I can do to dislodge that tact on his, point, on his part. He did have an obligation, and I agree, to investigate charges that perhaps there was more there than met the eye. But clearly, he has established in hundreds of interviews that no such activity or relationship existed. And in my opinion, I go back to the first statement. I believe that there's been some sort of obvious bias, some kind of slant to this whole report, because Food for Africa, by the document he prepared and my memorandum to him um, dated um, October of, or November of last year, state, there was no relationship. It can only be here for a red herring, and I find that personally offensive. I will conclude the rest of my remarks by saying that the Inspector General's desire to find a smoking gun in this investigation and his inability to do so in the course of a major investigative effort has created a serious myopic condition as it pertains to discerning elements of both truth and balance. For example, the report characterizes co-insurance lenders and mortgage brokers as MOD, as MOD rehab program participants. As the Inspector General is no doubt aware, these entities do not apply to HUD for MOD rehab funding, are not awardees of the MOD rehab units by PHAs, and are not assured of any business as a result of a PHA receiving an award of moderate rehabilitation funding. Lender selections Lender selection decisions by property owners are generally based on a competitive criteria such as interest rates, loan costs, speed of delivery, and numerous other non-HUD related factors. In addition to the five factors which we've just covered, the report in, of investigation charges that there was little or no documentation 
for PHA selected for funding by the Headquarters Committee, that there was little assurance that the units were allocated to PHAs equitably, and that the projects may not have been selected competitively. I cannot speak for that last part, and I cannot speak for what preceded my tenure at HUD, but I can speak to what occurred from January 1987 until May of 1988. This are just the copies of the papers I retained for my own personal files as to the documentation. Now, I don't know how he defines little or no, but this is part of what I based my decision on. And it's in the files at HUD, and he knows it. Each and every, and by the way, May 88, the Inspector, the Inspector General referred to four times in his testimony to the, to you this morning. In May of 1988, the selection process was profoundly and significantly changed. In fact, he states in his own report, in the own audit report, that it went from a closed, undocumented process to one resembling other programs that Mr. Shays referred to earlier in his questioning. I'm the guy that did that. That process was effective May 1988. It began in the fall of 1987 in terms of developing that process. And I have yet to find in that 700 pages where that is stated in terms of me, Tom Demery, the same guy on the title page, is given credit for developing and improving that system. Mr. Kemp is currently undergoing a review of the whole process as well he should and is certainly within his right. The, the formula and the format by which he is considering, I prepared, not the, one, not the process in place, but the basic format of using moderate rehab funding similar to the HODAG funding, which the Inspector General just mentioned, was based on documents Tom Demery prepared and made available to the Secretary staff. Why is the report entitled the way it is? Each and every allocation of moderate rehabilitation funds made while I was on the Headquarters Selection Committee was documented. At a minimum, such documentation would consist of a written request from the requesting public housing authority. Additional letters of support as well as supplemental submissions were maintained in the Office of Housing. The Inspector General interview of Susan Zagami at page 432 of the report states that PHA letters of request for units are maintained in book type files within the Office of Housing until they are acted on by the Selection Committee. The Inspector General interview of Deborah Dean at page 429 of the report investigation states, quote, PHAs throughout the country submitted their letter requests for mod rehab units to just about anyone in HUD they, the PHAs, thought could help their cause. I'm in, no longer in a position to delve into HUD files which document the applications considered for funding. I have been able to piece together a file containing many letter requests from a number of sources that I used in making my decisions, and again, I can't speak to what occurred before I came to HUD. The allocation of units on an equitable base equitable basis was also called in question in the Inspector General report. What the report does not disclose is the supposed relevance of this belief to the legal requirements of the Mod Rehab Program. As the members of this committee are no doubt aware and the Inspector, Gen and the Inspector General is remiss in not pointing out, the U.S. Congress had granted HUD a waiver of the Section 213D which relieved HUD of fair share responsibilities for the program since 84. Additionally, it is well known that Congress has also reduced the number of units available nationwide each fiscal year. Faced with diminishing resources and growing demand, <coughs> Headquarters committee, committee allocations during fiscal year 87 and fiscal 88 were based primarily on need. Need was defined as long waiting lists, housing shortages, and regional economic depressions. As such, South Florida and Puerto Rico received additional consideration on the basis of long waiting lists. Colorado, Oklahoma, Nevada, Louisiana, and Utah were afforded maximum consideration on the basis of regional economic conditions, which are no secret to anyone in this country. 
A shortage of affordable housing in Illinois, Virginia, and the District of Columbia were persuasive in considering applications from those areas. The members of this committee can take legis legislative notice of, this, of this, these facts. Poverty, shortages, and economic depression exist outside the exist in and outside the Beltway. The Inspector General should not obfuscate the issue by implying bad intentions on the part of responsible public officials. With respect to the competitive selection issue, I have made clear in my testimony that the function of selecting projects from among competing owner proposals is not within the purview um, of housing, the Office of Housing at HUD. It rests with, with the Office excuse me, with public housing agencies who receive these awards. I have submitted many memoranda to the field, which has urged the field offices to convey to public housing authorities their, their, the importance of the selection process at a competitive level. Um, I, I have stated in um, the PHAs must establish a method of selecting among owner proposals. Memos to the field have indicated that PHAs must make this method known to owners and that they must select among owners' proposals um, those proposals which it will approve. There is no evidence in the report investigation that these selection steps were not taken by responsible public housing authorities. In fact, in many cases it appears that sophisticated competitions were held which could serve as national models. With respect to the issue that was raised earlier this morning about tailor-made submissions, I received, and, and uh, Mr. Chairman, you're, you're correct, you've seen some of the letters, you know that they range from anything from one pages to, to one page request to a documented, a, a, a substantial request. Gastonia, North Carolina submitted not a letter, a one and a half inch binder for 82 units. Yes, it was specific. No, I was not lobbied. No, nothing was discussed with me as to who was behind it. I did not know until I read the uh, Inspector General's report that, that a consultant um, uh, was involved in this proje pro project. I recommended that selection, that request for funding, because it was on its own merits an exemplary example of how a PHA should go about the process of attracting the attention of the FHA commissioner for consideration. I did not invent the discretionary process for funding. I did not define discretionary. I took over a system and complied with a system which began three full years before I arrived at HUD, and I left HUD with a system that was greatly improved well documented, well into the open, and while maybe not perfect, was a long, far cry from what, from what it was. Mr. Chairman, I stand ready to answer any question you may have concerning my testimony or this report. Thank you very much, Mr. Demery. <clears throat> Let me begin by uh, one of the things that you stated at the outset. Uh, you made a very strong statement, I think it's probably fair to call it an accusation of the Inspector General or his staff. You accused them of malice, negligence, and cover-up. And I'm quoting you. Would you care to expand on those charges? Um, there was malice on the part of whom, directed at whom, there, I was neg uh, there was negligence on the part of whom with respect to what issues, and there was a cover-up on whose part designed to protect whom. I said in my statement that after rereading this thing, this report over the weekend, and trying to understand why it was titled the way it was, Thomas T. Demery, and singling me out, singling Thomas T. Demery the former, as there are several former FHA commissioners and assistant secretaries for housing, and several former other people involved in this decision-making process, why was I picked out? And I started to, I, I, I've read the national press. 
It is, it is, the report is designed to mislead the reader. If the report is designed, because there's a number of inaccuracies reported in the press as to what that report says or concluded because of the way it was framed. If those conclusions and inaccuracies are there and people don't really understand what's going on because the full picture is not given, and I am the subject of that report, and I know them not to be true, I question, I, I, believe, I believe that's either negligence or malice. I mean, it either happened by a gross oversight or was very, it was very calculated and, and directed. 75% of this report that bears my name was funded before I ever got to HUD. Well, let me, let me. I call that malice or negligence. You may call it something else. Well, my purpose is not to characterize no. it. I'm merely trying to elicit uh, responses from you. Um, and I will do so in a number of ways, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Emery. Uh, let us sort of divide the period of the Inspector General's report into two parts. Let us deal with the period during which you were not associated with HUD. Um, that period um, runs from January 1, 1984 until you joined HUD, which was when? I was sworn in October 21st, 1986. So let us deal with the period uh, from early 84 until the fall of 86. Um, you read the report now and you studied the report as you obviously had every uh, incentive to do. What is your appraisal of the report covering the period during which you were not employed at HUD? During that period, is there malice, negligence, and cover-up? And if so, during that period, are these uh, uh, directed at whom? If I can use the method of extrapolation from that was used to get to 413 million to answer your question, based on the random selections of information that occurred from the time I was there to now, um, and the conclusions that I reached, um, I, I have no way of knowing for sure what went on before I was there because I obviously wasn't there. Well, but I know that there were no knows, uh, I know even less because I never joined HUD, but you read the report, and the report covers a period, Ms. Demery, from January of 84 until the end of 1988. Is that correct? Yes. You have made a major point that you were not at HUD during 75% of the period. I won't quibble with you on the 75%, but you were not there during the first portion of that period. You were the responsible official, Federal Housing Administrator, Commissioner, during the latter part of that report. So let me direct your attention to the period prior to your joining HUD. Is the report without malice, negligence, and cover-up in that period? Does the malice, negligence, and cover-up begin with your joining HUD? Or does it let, let characterize me, the whole report? Let me, no. The, the, the words I used to describe my opinion of the report was as it related to the portions of the report while I was at HUD and the portions that were directed at me. All right. Now, how about the, the portions prior to your joining HUD? Do you think that basically the report, on the basis of all your knowledge, and you probably have far more knowledge than most people because you stepped into a very important position at HUD. You are obviously a man of great intelligence and experience in this field. Try to extricate yourself from this report and look at the early two and a half years and give me a characterization of that report. Is the report basically accurate, 
workmanlike, professional, or is it filled with malice, negligence, and cover-up? I don't know the accuracy of the statements or the conclusions that were <coughs> recorded and reached in the interviews and on the issues that he, that was, that's contained in this report prior to my getting there. I can state that the Inspector General was on the right track in terms of questioning the selection process. I questioned it myself. That's why I changed it. So from that standpoint, this, the, to the extent that he was getting hotline calls, to the extent that he was getting um, um, confidential sources, to the extent that there was a, a, a problem out there, and I said earlier, the Inspector General should and rightfully so have investigated those kinds of issues. But where, what I see happening is the conclusion to the investigation being the charge of the investigation and trying to find facts to fit that conclusion as opposed to the conclusion being an evolutionary process. Now, I don't know, for example, on, on really any, whether it was projects before I got to HUD or while I was at HUD, I don't and nowhere does it state here, for example, on the projects where consultants were used, how many other projects competed for this, at the PHA level for the award. Nowhere in this report, for example, does it state how many jobs former HUD officials or consultants were involved in where they competed and lost. It doesn't say that here. It would have you to believe that all they did was pick up the phone, an allocation was made, no documentation, no trail, no reasons. It went to the PHA. The PHA said, oh, well, this is magic. This is wonderful. God just blessed us. Here, Mr. Developer, here are the units. And one afternoon it was done was uh, the contact of uh, former Secretary of Interior Watt made during your tenure? I have never spoken to Secretary Watt while at HUD. I, I didn't suggest that you spoke with him. Was his contact with HUD done during your tenure? Um, uh, just a moment. I'm not clear when exactly he contacted the department. I tend to think not. I think the project that he contacted the department on was funded before I got there, but I could be wrong. Well, let's, let me ask Mr. Adams if you or one of your staff members can indicate when the what contact was made. My staff tells me it was approved before Mr. Bloom was in the so you can deal with it with a very high degree of objectivity because you were not there during that period. What is your appraisal of a former cabinet member, Secretary of the Interior, with no visible experience in housing, with low-cost housing, rehabilitation, subsidies, receiving a $300,000 quote, unquote, consulting fee for talking, and I'm quoting from Mr. Watt's uh, uh, discussion with the Inspector General to the right people and receiving a $300,000 payment, which, as we established earlier, may be uh, the amount that uh, the average uh, family in a housing unit earns over a 15-year period. Well, I think maybe the best person to answer that question, Mr. Chairman, is the guy that wrote him the check, because I sure can't answer I that. Will int I intend to ask Mr. Watt when he appears before this well, subcommittee. I'm asking you now. I don't know. Well, you have a judgment. You are a very intelligent person about how these consulting fees go. And you are under oath. So I'm merely asking. You were not involved with the, with right. the James Watt matter. You have no opinion on it? 
I don't know. I will have an opinion once I'm more aware of the facts surrounding it. I don't know. Um, based on what is presented here, it doesn't look good. But I don't know what beyond what's presented here occurred. And before I could have an opinion, I'd like to know what those addi additional facts, if any, were. Mm -hmm. Well, let me deal with uh, some, um, some events that uh, took place while you were there. <coughs> to clear up this question of malice, negligence, and cover up, is it your testimony that those relate to portions of the report after you assume a position with HUD, but not prior to that? or that they characterize the entire report? It is my testimony that the report It is my testimony that it's after I, I became Assistant Secretary for Housing that is most noted, that I reacted most to. So Mr. Adams and his people, according to your testimony, seem to have had no malice vis-a-vis -vis anyone else at HUD except you? I can't speak for anybody else. I, all well, I on know, the basis you know, of the report. All I know is their name isn't on the title page. Had this title page been, been, in, been uh, called the Moderate Rehabilitation Section 8 Program Investigation and Audit, I wouldn't have said what I just did. But it doesn't. It, it was an investigation on me. It has resulted in great personal harm and injury to my reputation. And I, you know, I have, I guess my reaction would be different. If he wants to blast everybody that was at HUD during his audit period and investigation, that's fine. But unless he has some specific reasons, which are proved conclusively by his investigation, as to why one should be singled out, I have to question the motive. And I did. You know, you read in the papers nationwide, Thomas T. Demery, subject of an de ongoing Department of Justice investigation. Why? Because my name is in this book on the title page. If, if, it had, if your name had not appeared on the title page, would you still feel that the report is filled with malice, uh, negligence, and is a cover-up? I would have just characterized the report as being misleading and inconclusive. But not containing malice. Correct. Whom was Mr. Adams and his staff, in your view, trying to cover up for? Whose name should have appeared on the cover, if not it, yours? It's not, it's not a question of anybody's name should have appeared. I think, I think the investigation should have taken the direction of investigating the program fairly within the audit period and the investigative period equally. Well, the word cover-up has a very clear meaning in the English language. What was the Inspector General attempting to cover up? Or for whom was he attempting to cover up? This is your phrase, Mr. Demery, and I'm asking you to explain it. Or if you choose, you may care to withdraw it. I don't, I don't care to withdraw it. Then please explain it. I used it in the general sense of the word cover-up. I don't have any specific information because had I had specific information of, of the report covering anything up in particular, I would have made it known. But the fact remains is that I... Well, the the Inspector General's I, job is to uncover wrongdoing, not to cover up. The purpose of, of the report, the purpose of an inspector's general report in any federal agency is to uncover problems, improprieties, difficulties, or what have you, not I, to cover up for those. I, I agree. And if, in fact, you are using a term with a very clear meaning, you are accusing the inspector general of HUD of a cover-up, you are obligated to explain that. The Inspector General does have an obligation to uncover things. That's and in right. his attempt to uncover my role in this process, 
My bank records were made available. My telephone logs were made available. My diaries were made available. My travel was made available. Every as my income tax records were made available. Every aspect of my life was made available and reviewed and passed on and judged and found no evidence of wrongdoing by the Inspector General. I am not by my statement. I did not make the statement that I was um, the focal point of the mod rehab selection process, for example. My question, and I truly don't know because it's not indicated here in this report, and if every other person associated with the funding process of mod rehab during the audit period received the same treatment, I will withdraw my statement. Well, you are not answering my question, Mr. Emery. I'm asking you to explain your charge of cover-up. What was the cover-up? Uh, I, you, I think you're arguing with it. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. I, think I am argue. directing the witness counsel to answer the question. Okay. If counsel wishes to address the chair or do more than advise his client, he will be sworn in. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Please rephrase the question. I now. will be happy to, Mr. Demery. I believe I have been, as I always try to be eminently fair in my questioning. I praised you at the outset for voluntarily appearing, not under subpoena. I indicated that I will not explore the Africa charity issue because I believe it's a reputable charity. And while some may raise questions as to why all these people doing business with HUD suddenly discovered that they wanted to contribute to it, I will not choose to pursue that. You started out your statement by accusing the Inspector General and his staff and his investigation of malice, negligence, and cover-up. The word cover-up has a very precise meaning in the English language. I'm asking you to explain what you meant by the term cover-up. To the extent that all of the personal affairs in my life were examined by the Inspector General in an effort to, de un to determine and uncover any wrongdoing, any, any favoritism, any issue associated with the funding. I cooperated, that's fine. To the extent that that was not done with everyone else associated with that process in that same time frame, I question why. So what your point is that you were investigated more intensively than others? Yes, that's my testimony. You were a uh, Federal Housing Commissioner for part of the period under investigation. Who else occupied that position during the whole period? The, the point that I wanted to make was that I was not the focal point in the mod rehab process. I think contained in this report, there are statements by persons who, who said that they were the focal point in this process. And it's not my... It's not my intent to have every former FHA commissioner, every, uh, every executive assistant to the secretary and secretary Pierce, as well as undersecretary and general counsel, investigate it. To the same, I wouldn't wish that on my enemy. Uh, Mr. Demery, in your testimony on page two, you state that at no time before the release of the inspector general's report were you aware of who functioned as a consultant. Is that correct? Yes. Prior to the release of this report, did you know Gerald Kistner and did you know he was a consultant? I knew Gerald Kistner. Did you know he was a consultant? No, I did not know he was a consultant. I know he had an interest in, in um, HUD programs. What was his previous position with HUD? I don't know. He was Deputy General Counsel of HUD. Uh, Did you have any meetings with him? Yes, I met with him twice. On that what I, subjects? That, that I can recall. Mainly the direction of um, um, where the department was going, what other new opportunities there might be available for, for people in the housing business. There was no discussion of any specific project? No. Not that I recall. Mm -hmm. I don't recall even discussing mod rehab. Your uh, appointment calendar, which was subpoenaed, I take it, or received by the Inspector General's investigation, 
has an entry date at Monday, January 12, from 3 to 3.45, Mr. Gerald Kissner, Ray Mod Rehab. I'm not sure that meeting occurred. I know that we had, ske we had scheduled some meetings, um, um, and there were one or two meetings that were scheduled before we actually first met that for one reason or another did not occur. And to the best of your recollection, he and Mr. Kissner never discussed the MOD rehab program. Part, he and Mr. Kissner? You and Mr. Oh. Kissner. I do not recall any discussions with Mr. Kissner on the MOD rehab program. According to your phone logs, he called you on September 10, 1987, January 6, 1988, January 1988, and January 28, 1988, he stopped by and asked to see you. Do you recall these episodes? I recall seeing the messages, yes. I don't know that I returned those calls. I could have delegated them to other staff. Um, I, I, we had no specific conversations that I can recall on any specific project. Now, Prior to your joining HUD, was this program, in your view, handled uh, in an appropriate and uh, objective and competitive fashion? It really wasn't my place. Um, the system was in place when I got to HUD. I was instructed as, the, as to what well, the, the system... The system was in place before, before Jack Kemp got to HUD, but he found it unacceptable, and he's calling for changes in the yes, system. As, as the Inspector General noted in his report, in his audit report on page, on page 10, in the fall of 1987, the selection process for fiscal year 1988 was changed significantly. As opposed to the undocumented and closed process, a rating and ranking process was developed that was patterned after systems used in other HUD programs. That is the program that I instituted. Those changes were as a result of me. I believe the system needed to be changed, and once I understood in what areas and how it could be changed, I set about doing that. But if you change the system, you presumably had some reservations about the pre-existing system. Can, you, outli would, can I, you outline those for I, us? I was, I had, the reservations that I had were really very simple. It was a discretionary process that had only my signature on the funding document. Those were my reservations. I required that new letter requests be submitted, I wasn't funding off of multi-year dated um, letter requests, like from 1983, 1984. I initiated new memorandum to the field calling specific attention uh, to the need for competitive selection at the PHA level. I started documenting funding decisions as, as um, uh, developed by the committee. Um, Secretary Pierce informed me in January 1987 that there, that there was to be a committee format for funding selections. Um, I tried to present as much information as I could while in committee meetings as to why and what um, decisions should be made. I tried to define need. As I stated in my earlier testimony, I, I instituted a series of controls that, were event that eventually resulted in a significantly changed process. Whom do you blame for the previous process, which clearly was unacceptable to you, because you changed it, or you recommended that it be changed? That was the system that was in place. The decisions that went into changing it back in 1983 and 84 I, I was unaware of what input, what reasons, what rationale, what analysis went into it. So I, 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 I it isn't, it really isn't for me to say who did what 
right or wrong when because I just wasn't aware of all of the facts that went into the decision. It was a process in existence. You indicated that uh, when you came into HUD, it was explained to you that the selection process was discretionary in this program. Is that correct? <coughs> yes, sir. What did you understand by the word discretionary? That the secretary and the, that the secretary would decide in his own judgment which PHA requests would be funded. He would rely, his, his judgment would rely on input from his executive assistant, the assistant secretary for housing, and the undersecretary. He established a meeting, a, a, a committee meeting, a selection committee, excuse me, to meet. I think our first meeting was in March of 1987 to um, give him that input. Mr. Emery, according to the Inspector General's report, you received calls from developers inquiring about purchasing mud rehab units. Is that correct? I'm on a, what, what page on the report is that? Well, we will find the page, assuming that, that it is in the report, assuming that you read the well, report. I need to read it in context because I'm, I'm not familiar with. All right, we will, we will find that for you. Page 424. I will read which, the approach. I will read the paragraph. paragraph. This relates to your uh, interview with the Inspector General. It says, Demery initially denied knowledge of, but later admitted to being aware of the, quote, industry talk, end quote, to the effect that mod rehab units could be purchased. Demery advised that this type of rumor is of no real concern to him because he knows it to be untrue. Demery said he has received telephone calls from developers who attempted to inquire about purchasing mud rehab units, but he would simply tell them that the rumor was untrue and, and, uh, and hung up the telephone. When asked why he did not explore the matter further and attempt to identify the source of the rumor, Demery stated that the developer in all probability would not have been truthful or would have declined to tell him anything. Does this refresh your memory? Yes. Can you explain to us how many such episodes there were when you got a telephone call from somebody who claimed to be a developer and wanted to purchase units? I recall no specific conversation, uh, nor do I recall a number. I mean, it was, it was less than three. I don't know if it was one, two, or three. Um, generally, there is, I get a lot of telephone calls. I got a lot of telephone calls, and it was my nature. These are unusual telephone calls, are they not? I received many unusual telephone calls covering a range of subjects. And generally, um, when someone wants to talk to the FHA commissioner about a, a problem, an issue, or a question, it has been my practice to respond, either immediately or I would call people back. I would have no way of knowing, and the staff does a pretty good job in terms of of, of trying to screen and assist incoming calls as to who could be helpful and who could not. Whether I answered the phone immediately or whether I called someone back on a return call basis, uh, the conversation um, would, would center on mod rehab. How does someone go about doing mod rehab? I would instruct them to, to um, see how active their PHA was in the mod rehab program. If the mod rehab program was unknown to them, they could call and we would be helpful to them. He would, um, there was a, a, a call about uh, uh, following that line of, of, of questioning. He would say, well, I understand that I can buy mod rehab units. And I explained to him the process that no one can sell mod rehab units and that anyone who represents themselves as being able to sell mod rehab units was incorrect and, and 
you would be foolish to believe them. I explained the process. Thank me very much. Goodbye. Congressman Shays. Just as a parenthetical, um, as one who occasionally called you, I can, I can verify that you don't always return phone calls, and that's not meant as a criticism. It's just meant that uh, I experienced it firsthand. Uh, you had a lot to take care of. You had the whole country. I have a number of questions. It, um, I just would, would say, and I, I would hope you would, would agree, that we've got a big problem at HUD, and we need to know why and do something about it, and ultimately those responsible need to be held accountable. And I, I felt your comments, um, I had a lot of sympathy for your comments that from your perspective, uh, the report was malicious uh, and you felt there was negligence um, because your name was on the report, and I, I wonder why your name was, in fact, on the report, since you make a point that's well taken that there were others there as well. And um, the bulk of the report covered projects before I ever got there. I think that's very valid. Yeah. Uh, uh, but having said that, I have a big problem with, with your point about a cover-up. I can understand your frustrations, but I have to tell you, as someone who's trying to give you uh, a very fair hearing and to listen to what you're saying, and grateful I'm not in your shoes, very honestly, um, uh, you, you, there was nothing that, that convinces me in any way that there's a cover-up. And it just seems to me, I'm going to tell you how I take your comments. I'm going to take them as a frustration point, but <coughs> some that clearly aren't substantiated. If you feel you have some leads for this committee uh, that you don't feel publicly or justify a comment, but you feel you have some leads, I would hope that you would share it with this committee because well, clearly we want to get at, at the problem. Mr. Shays. I have had this report a little over a week. There's been an enormous amount of information to absorb and to, and to prepare accurate um, press interviews and to prepare um, for what I knew were to be eventual hearings. Notwithstanding this testimony and the testimony I will give before other committees later in the week and next week, I have no intentions of putting this report aside and forgetting about it as if it never happened. No. This has affected my life and no, to the made, extent to, to the extent clear. that I develop additional information, Mr. Shays, that I think will help exemplify and typify in the in the specific as opposed to just the general sense of of, of cover up, I will be happy to make it available. I'm just making the point to you that, that I've heard nothing that would substantiate that charge and, and feel in a, in a sense that you've made some very emphatic statements that that I think, and on the record, uh, being sworn in, which are to your credit, um, it just seems to me that you, you kind of hurt your credibility with that last comment. I just wanted to share it with you. I, um, you made the point that you questioned the process myself and did something about it. This is the process of granting uh, the Mod Rehab Program grants. And I'd like to know what specifically was your motive for changing it. Uh, I'd like to know I'd like you to review with me what specific changes you made in the process and when you made those changes. That would be helpful to me. First, your motive for changing it. As FHA Commissioner, there were a number of housing programs that I was responsible for. There was the 202 program, there was the HODAG program, voucher program, um, the certificate program, a, a number of, of Section 8 programs that I was in charge of. This was the only one, this was the only program that whose selection and funding process was handled um, outside of a um, clear trail of documentation and, and a clear um, review process um, by various program offices in HUD. By its atypical nature, it called attention to itself in my view. In trying to understand how it might be made better, I initially 
started to when I when I attended the meetings with the selection committee provide additional documentation. I was told that a documentation is not needed. This was a discretionary program of the secretary and that additional documentation was not needed. Well, if it was not needed for the committee meeting, it certainly was needed for me and I did. I kept what I what I felt I needed since it was my name on the funding decision. This is but a sample of what I kept and what I based my decision on. When the undersecretary position was filled by Carl Kovitz and our, the selection committee meeting, the selection committee met again in, April, in um, August of 1987. We're still talking just about the motive first. Are you finished with the motive or the, the reason for changing it? Well, again, I brought up the question of documentation and the need to document, and I was told it was a discretionary program. Documentation was not needed. Uh, uh, you named about five programs, but this clearly is the one that has the most discretion. It's a discretionary program. Did, did, was one of the motives, it would seem logical to me it would be, uh, when you have a developer call up and say he can buy it, that seems to me that it would raise, that, it would send bells off. Now, that was, you have my phone logs. If you've not seen them all, then they're certainly available. And I'm going to tell you, I don't want to look at all your phone logs. Um, <laughs> you know, one call would not, one goof, goofy call like that would not uh, trigger that kind of a response in me. I knew just programmatically the difference between the way the Madriya program was being funded and the rest of the Section 8 programs. See, what troubles me, though, with your answer, and maybe you could respond, is that the motive seems, in a sense, you need a paper trail. It almost seems like, you know, to, excuse me for saying it, you know, like cover your tracks. Um, it would seem to me the motive would really logically be there's a problem with this program. Uh, it's not going where it's needed. We better have a better process. Uh, okay. Well, we do need a better process. I take exception to the fact that the money wasn't going where it was needed. Um, it, the money did go where it was needed. Let me the ask problem you. was yeah. that the demand was far more than the supply. Basically, you're saying you could have given it to almost anyone and, and they would have benefited. But ultimately, ultimately, everybody needs it, but some need it more than others. And that's ideally how we want the program to work, is to, to identify where's the best place to put it. But review with me what, what specifically, the specific changes you made and when you made them. And when you made them is very important to me. We could, we could start with the last question. When did you make these changes? The process really began in late 87 uh, in terms of coming up with a proposal, <clears throat> a proposal that would be um, competitive, that would be documented, that would involve the staff, that would involve the regions that would um, um, be a, pr a funding process that was similar to the other programs of HUD. I prepared an abstract, excuse me, the other uh, programs in housing. I prepared a, an abstract to the secretary and delivered it to him in January or February of 1988 as to um, this new process process was developed with the Office of General Counsel and the program staff. Secretary approved the changes. We then went ahead and implemented uh, those changes in, in March 25th, 1988, if my memory serves me right. We detailed to the field what those new procedures would be. And uh, in May 1988, the system was in place. Um, and um, fundings for fiscal year 88, uh, the balance of fiscal year 88, were, were done in accordance with the revised system. Will, will my colleague yield sure. at that point? You're making a very important point, Mr. Demery. Secretary Kemp apparently does not agree with you. Let me read the relevant portion of his letter to me. He does not differentiate between the period where you claim you have put new programs in effect. He stopped all actions. And this is what he says. I'm disturbed by findings in the report which indicate some fundamental flaws in the funding process of the moderate rehabilitation subsidy program. The IG's audit indicated that the selection and allocation process 
for moderate rehabilitation funds in previous years was undocumented. This letter is dated May 5, 1989. He talks about all previous years. Ignored existing standards and regulations and was based on the perception and reality of favoritism and abuse of non-public information. Therefore, I've taken actions to uphold the integrity of HUD's funding programs and ensure that all HUD funding selections are made equitably and for the benefit of low-income families. He has canceled, letter goes on to say, I've canceled all fiscal year 1989 funding selections. Now, he canceled all of the funding selections during your tenure. So Secretary Kemp apparently is not under the impression that you found the program which was in place that was flawed, and then you put in a new program which is not flawed, because he, in fact, stopped, canceled all fiscal year 1989 funding. I don't know what was explained to Secretary Kemp and what was not explained to Secretary Kemp, but you heard Mr. Adams state four times in his testimony this morning Basically, May 88, he, he, would answer, he would answer questions relative to allegations in the following way because I was listening and we can have some of the answers read back. Yes, that was true. That was undocumented. Yes, it was undisciplined. Yes, it was discretionary until May 1988. He said that four times. Now, whether he explained to the Secretary the difference between what followed May 88 to what preceded it or not, I don't know. I have not explain it to Secretary Kemp because he's not asked me. With respect to... Well, let me stop you on May 1988. By May 1988, you have served in your position as Federal Housing Commissioner with key responsibility for these funding decisions for what? Almost a year and a half, two years. A year and a half. A year yes. and a half. I thank my colleague. Um, just, just continuing with the question I'm asking and also the Chairman asked, the... Um, <laughs> You contacted the, the secretary, and, and in March, uh, he signed off on this new process. And they were incorporated and began to be public policy in HUD in May of 88. Uh, what documentation would be helpful for me to, to see this? In other words, there must be documentation with the secretary and documentation with you, and documentation that you disseminated throughout the country talking about this new process. There are. Again, I think, the, I think the memo to the field, and I could be, I could be mistaken, but I think the date was um, March 25th, 1988, in terms of the public document that was going to explain how the new process was. This was the, by the way, the document the Inspector General referred to in his testimony this morning, which once signed as a public document that I gave to someone who was in my office who inquired about the status of the Mod Rehab program. I gave him a public document as a member of the public. Now, it's true that he received it because he was in my office faster than the office in Seattle, Washington received it, but the fact of the matter is it was a public document. Wouldn't you, wouldn't, I'm sorry. Okay, that was the official notification to the field. HUD has in its files, and I can research what what few files uh, and notes that I have remaining. I have copies of the abstract and that I sent the secretary. I think I have copies of, of that process. And I'm sure the inspector general has copies of all of those public documents as well. Uh, I, I just, Mr. Shays, I don't have it available for you at this moment. It just seems to me that that document is really a key document. The, the investigation took place um, in March of 88 and extended uh, uh, closer to the end of the year, to November, I think. Well, yeah. So it strikes me as a, 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 there's a, a real connection. Lack of focus, lack yeah. of emphasis, lack of, yes, it, it strikes me the same way. But he does say in the audit report. No, I, I don't understand what you just said to me. Uh, it, it seems to be a significant event yeah. given all the audit period until May 1988. Mm -hmm. It represents, in my estimation, there's significant change in the way things work and the direction the program was headed. It would seem to me, in the interest of balance, in the interest of, of, of fairness, that if an audit and an investigation was going to cover a period of time, a full six months 
um, before the audit period ended where there was a dramatic and significant change, it would have been received more play than, than beginning on page 640 of the audit of the investi combined investigative and audit report. And it does. He does, the Inspector General does say, I'm starting on page 10, he describes the revised selection process. I, I guess my problem is this. Um, my problem is that you have an investigation that started March 88 and went to December 88. Uh, you've made it very clear that 75 percent of the problem occurred before your time. And, and as the chairman calls it, pre-demory, post-demory. Um, pre-demory, January 1st, 84 to October 86, when you just joined, that's 33 months. And then we have your time, I don't mean post-demory, but actual demory time of October 8, 86 to November 30th, 88 when you were in, in the department, that's 26 months. So there's 33 months, 26, and I'm trying to figure out this 75 percent. It's not, it's not time. It must no. be, are you saying that 75 percent of the alleged alle wrongdoing took place before you? 75 percent of this book deals with projects that were funded before I came okay. to HUD. Okay. Now, you've been, as the chairman pointed out, though, you were in office uh, uh, a year and a half before you started to feel that there should be some changes made. Um, no, sir. Okay. I began the process in 87, in the fall. The, pro the process was approved and implement and operational um, in the spring of 88. Okay, in May. Why would, why would it take uh, even, I mean, it strike me, and I'll show you how my mind works. You've got a program that's handled one way, and then you have this one, one program in which we're talking about billion, a billion dollars over a period of five years handled this way in which, as you point out, you're the only name on the document, uh, which would tell me is I got a hell of a lot of power. My, I'm the only, not only am I the only name, I'm ultimately the one who decides. And it, and, it, and it took a year before that process began, and then it took, it took almost six months, if not longer, for it to be implemented. It seemed to me you, you'd go to, to the secretary and say, We've got, we handled it this way for, for five of them, or six, or whatever, and we're handling it this way, I don't want to give out any more grants. We got a big problem here. We got to incorporate some regulations and rules, and we better follow it. And until we do, I, I don't want to see this thing funded. The first two fundings that I took pl that I signed when I was at when I was assistant secretary occurred between the months of of October '86 and January 13, 1987. I was given a list of funding actions that were approved by the secretary and told to fund them. I did so against what I thought was a prudent and proper response. I asked the general counsel during that time frame to explain to me what the delegation of authority was on this program so that I would know if I was, Mr. Uh, Mr. Shays, the one who could up or down a funding decision. I discovered that I was not. I requested- Who, who was? I requested a meeting with Secretary Pierce for him to explain to me how this program was to be handled. January 13th, I met with Secretary Pierce, his executive assistant, Deborah Dean, and myself, and it was explained to me once again, as Ms. Dean had, had been informing me all along, that this was the Secretary's discretionary program and that he is the one that makes the decisions and that the Secretary then explained to me how he makes his decisions through a, a committee process and he then instituted the committee, and from that point forward, I wasn't just given lists anymore of what the secretary, quote, wanted to have funded, but rather we went through a, dis a, a, a period of discussion. And from that time for period on is when we started making reforms. Now, I might add also that um, ex um, accelerating the process and perhaps uh, motivating the final the final uh, implementation of reform was when Undersecretary Kovitz uh, came to the department and we met in a funding committee action. He asked the general counsel to review again the, di the discretionary um, nature and, and to make sure it complies with, with all outstanding regs and so on. Which, um, what, I, what I think I hear you telling me is that basically, I mean, it was a fairly strong statement. It wasn't your decision. You were basically told to fund these. 
you're a new person in the agency, you, you've got a directive from the secretary of HUD that says this is what will be funded, and you're going to do it, and I can, I can see that. And it raised some questions in your mind, and then you found out about the committee and the discretionary funds. Let me just pursue that a little bit. I was thinking when we talked about discretionary funds that they were discretionary to you, but what I'm beginning to realize is these, in fact, are funds that went into the secretary of HUD's, uh, it went into a fund for him to have discretion, correct? Well, no, the funds were to the Office of Housing. That's why I, as the commissioner, signed it as opposed to uh, some of the other funds. I, th I think the secretary himself signs the funding documents. Well, on. let me ask you this, though. Um, for instance, there was seven million allocated in Connecticut um, for the Section 202 direct loan fund. And there were only, believe it or not, only four agencies in the, this is in the 80, end of 87 fiscal year, there were only four um, uh, individual applications in the entire state of Connecticut. And only, I think, one was funded, and about, or two, excuse me, um, and, and about $5 million lapsed. And I'm told that went into a discretionary fund administered by whom? This is in the 202 program? Yeah. 85% of it is made available to 85% of the total 202 funding is okay. made available um, to the field. 15% is withheld in, the head, in a headquarters reserve or discretion. Is that your discretion or is that this, the secretary's discretion? Or a combination of the I two? think it's a combination <coughs> of both. He but isn't it true that, the, that when 85% isn't spent, the lapse money then goes into this fund and the fund becomes a lot bigger? It, I believe it is true that it goes into the headquarters reserve uh, total, but I don't think that there's, it, it doesn't grow it, with any great magnitude that I'm aware of. Well, I just know that in Connecticut, $5 million, I was thinking, you know, here you got a, a, a state uh, with serious housing problems, an older state, a lot of old housing as well, and you have only four people applying because they didn't think any money was available, which raises a, a question about how we disseminate information, which is something that I know the chairman and I want to get into. But it also raises questions, what happened to those funds when they weren't spent? And my understanding is, and, and you would know better than I would, that this, this money is put into the discretionary account. That 15% becomes larger. It certainly became $5 million larger because it wasn't spent in Connecticut where it was earmarked to go. Okay. okay. So I guess what I'm saying to you is that it seems to me you're saying that there was a lot of discretion uh, was clearly in the, on the part of ultimately the secretary of, of HUD. And in the in, beginning... In, in what program? Well, just taking your program to start with. In, in the Madria program? Yeah, the, the one you took over, and these are the programs that are going to be funded. You didn't know why. You signed off on them. And as you said, you put your name on the line, and you didn't really know all that much about it. You were a new person. But that had been decided. And it raises the question, um, when you talk about your, I'd like to know who your predecessors were during this time of, of the investigation. In other words, starting from that, uh, that period in 84. Did you have more than one person who had had that position before you? Do you know what? Do you, do you know um, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. The, um, my immediate predecessor was Silvio de Bartolomez okay. in an acting capacity. And I think Janet Hale was in an acting capacity. <clears throat> and I think January 184, I think Maurice Barksdale was so also. So there were three people who held your position, some in an acting capacity. Right. Um, but Deborah Gordine comes up a lot. She uh, was there throughout. She was there throughout. And it, and, and it strikes me that the message I'm getting from you is that those of you in the position you're in right now, uh, in your position, you really had to answer directly uh, through Deborah Gordine to the secretary. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So she clearly is an active player in this whole process. Um, well, she say, states correctly so that she was the focal point of my rehab funding. I mean, her statement okay. says that. Okay. During what, what, I'm sorry. During the audit period. Why do you think, given it was your responsibility in terms of you had ultimately your name on the line and your predecessors had their name on the line, why do you think in this program uh, there was such active participation on the part of, of a secretary's uh, uh, executive assistant? I can't answer that. Okay. 
it's a question I want answered eventually, and I appreciate that you can't, but it just strikes me that um, you've made a point that, that I think is well taken. You were there for part of the time. Um, while I may have some questions as to why you didn't implement changes sooner, uh, you have told me specifically that changes were made at the beginning. Uh, all th the investigation took place, started in March. Ultimately, these regulations took place, or rules or process took place in May. And that raises some big questions in my mind of wondering if this wasn't motivated by the investigation. But, but it can e be answered very easily. Uh, and to your credit, you said, you know, you wrote the secretary. There's documents there. And so we, we have to find those documents. And I think then your point is well taken. But it does raise some questions to me as to why there was such an active participation on the part of the secretary. Uh, Mr. Shea, I, I would like to answer. Um, Mr. Lantos's, uh, or Chairman Lantos's um, statement a little bit earlier. I want to amplify in an answer, if I could, sir, as to Secretary Kemp's um, decision to recall the 1989 funding based on a system that I, I am touting as being much improved, a newer, better version of the old modern rehab. Um, the audit report does speak to flaws within the system that the Inspector General has found uh, some, some criticisms. And I said, while it was, it was vastly improved, it was not perfect. Um, it is perhaps for that reason that Secretary Kemp um, did what he did in terms of the recall. I think he's striving to, to find a system that um, you know, is, is above reproach in, in all respects. But I, I, I wanted to also just call to your attention that in the, in the design and in the operation of that system, I have asked on, on several occasions that the Inspector General participate in the design and in the um, implementation and overseeing of the new system. In fact, I asked him on, on um, um, May 5th, I asked him. What uh, year? Uh, 1988. Uh, to. Um, sir, I, I sent him a memo which states, please let this memo serve as a follow-up to our conversation of April 27, 88, regarding IG participation in future moderate rehabilitation Section 8 selections. As your office is currently in the midst of a national program review with numerous questions as to selection, criteria, and qualifications that date as far back as 84, it seems to me the logical time and place to deal with similar questions like this in the future, um, it would seem to me that the logical time and place to deal with similar questions like this in the future would be for your office to have input with future selections. To the extent your charter does not permit you to participate in an active capacity with selection decisions, because I had earlier asked him to sit in as, a, as an active participant in the selection process, I would request your attendance in a passive or observatory role so as to note the proceedings and neutralize the possibility of perfect recall at some point in the future by selection committee members. Now, this wasn't the three-person panel that the secretary set up. This was the staff-level panels I set up. Yeah. I, I'm a little confused. I'm sorry. Um, the reason I'm confused, it seems to me, you started last in 87, in the fall of 87, with recommendations. And for some reason, it took until March for it to really reach the secretary's desk. And then in March, um, the secretary signed off, and then there was a dissemination of rules and pro a process that was to be followed in May. And it strikes me that that um, no, uh, it, 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 the the reason there were no fundings between those time frames. Yeah, it was a question of notice of 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 getting field office responses back, evaluation process. There was a there was a, it was a complex, detailed system that went in place before any funding occurred, okay. but from, I think from... Um, but why would we need to make any changes? You had it in place, it should be working. It's gonna be modeled like some of the other programs. Oh, no, my point was I had invited the Inspector General's... But I don't see why he needed to. I guess my point is, uh, let me just tell you, let me be very candid here. You, basically, and uh, you can answer this question first, um, when were you aware that the, that the IG was investigating the way the uh, mod rehab program was being handled? When, when did you become aware of that?
Um, I, I don't. I don't really know. Well, that, that's a that's an important question. I mean, it, when were when were your records subpoenaed? I, I, I think in, uh, I think last summer sometime, but I, I just don't remember. So after, after May, your testimony is that after May, after you had promulgated these rules, which I haven't seen yet, but which are available clearly, um, uh, then you became aware that there was an investigation of the Ahmad rehab program? It's my testimony. I don't remember, but I think that's. I think that sounds right. I mean, I know that. I know that that um, information went to the secretary in February of '88. What, what is um, February of '88? The investigation began in March of '88. Isn't that correct, uh, Mr. Ig? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. No, the the process the process began oh, before. I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood you. Your point to me is that in February '88 the process began uh, with the secretary in terms of changing these rules and regulations. Right. Okay. Uh, let me just ask one other area of questioning. The um, the sad fact is that only about out of, out of the 33,000 housing authorities, only about 150, 3,300. Right. 3,300, is that correct? Right. Okay. Oh, just over 3,000. Um, only about 150 were invited to participate. Why was that so? Was, that was so for the following reasons. Congress did not grant the department a waiver of the 213D fair share regulation, which meant that the limited number of units that we had available for fiscal year 1989 had to be fair shared, um, fair shared among the regions. Actually, the, the remaining units we had available for fiscal year 88 and then for 89, um, the numbers were too small to throw it open to all 3,000 PHAs that would be eligible to participate. Is your testimony that, that the amount of money available simply wasn't enough to go to so many, so you tried to to, in a yes. sense, pre-qualify individuals? Yes. How did you determine the 150? We asked the, uh, regional, the regional offices to submit um, PHAs they felt were, were in need and had demonstrated capacity to uh, administer the program. Um, under what basis, again, would they have made that determination? They work with them on a regular basis. Okay. They would be closer to the PHAs in their jurisdiction than would Washington. Is that a standard practice for some of the other programs? Because we have basically limited amounts of money for all these programs. In other words, why just the rehab? Why not some of the other programs that you mentioned? The voucher, every, everything is underfunded. Well, t to the extent that that's true, I was faced with the responsibilities of, of making what I had work. Yeah. And I thought that the best way to make it work would be to um, have a guest list or a list of invitees that was of a manageable and reasonable number as determined and generated from outside of Washington. Now, if, you know... Wouldn't you agree, though, that just kind of lends credence to this whole argument that um, uh, those in high places or in favored positions tended to be um, uh, able to, uh, to get these grants, and there were a lot who simply didn't even know they were available. It, it, may, it may speak to the not knowing it was availability, not knowing it was available issue. I'll grant you that. But in terms of the way it actually functioned, there were a number of, of PHAs that applied for mod rehab under, because the RA recommended that they be on the list, that put together very good applications that were, in fact, funded. They were rated and ranked by the various um, housing staff members and came up with a, 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 a very good application and did in fact receive funding. So it worked in fact to the opposite. Basically, let me just be very candid with you on one point. It, you, you came in in October of 86, correct? correct. So um, uh, we're talking about the 86-87 fiscal year. No, we're talking fiscal year 87. Uh, I mean 86-87, yeah, the, uh, the end number is the fiscal year, the 87 fiscal year. Um, and it just strikes me that, that uh, it, it would have seemed to me, after having gone through this, you would have started the process a lot sooner 
to change this one area and that, um, and that it, it shouldn't have taken so long. And I've got a big problem with how long it took. Uh, I know you well enough to know that uh, when you make a decision, you can make it pretty quickly. When it's mine alone to make, you betcha. Yeah. Well, it, it took a long time from October to, to April to get to the you know, secretary, or February to get to the secretary's desk. Seems to me you could have just walked it up. Let me, let me back up one more time. Mm -hmm. I was told how it was to be done, and that was what I did. Right. I did not invent the system. I did not accept it, but when I was directed, I followed it. Okay. Well, what that, says, what that says to me is that you didn't like the system, you did it, because that's what you were told to do, and ultimately you feel you had a part in changing it. I wasn't the only one that didn't like the system. Okay. I mean, my, my immediate predecessor, when it came time to sign these documents it's, for funding, Silvio de Bartolomé's, he left town. You know what he did? He left town, became a consultant, and started Not to make true. some money? No? Pardon me? I think there were two funding runs while he was acting FHA Let me, let me just end then with this. On page 424 of the IG's report, which does have your name on the front of it, and I can understand why you wouldn't want it there. Um, I'm looking at the second to last. We're, we're talking about the dissemination of information, and you, you said you knowingly didn't disseminate any information. Here it describes where he was talking with you, and um, am I reading incorrectly? D didn't you hand him ultimately a letter describing the rehab program? I'm on page 424. He, it, uh, the last uh, part of it, he said, he said, on page 424, the second to last paragraph, in the middle it says, Demery and DeBartolomus was in his office for a visit, primarily to introduce his fiancée, and during their conversation, DeBartolomus asked for a copy of the memorandum, so he gave it, in other words, yeah, you. I gave him a public document, right. Okay. Uh, now, why would he have asked for that document? What was, he, what was he interested in? I mean, you described a man who simply didn't like this process at all and didn't want to sign off no, on no, it. No, wait, wait. Am I getting... Maybe, 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 I, maybe I wasn't clear in what I said. The part of the process he didn't like is when he, had, when he had to sign his name to a bunch of funding documents he was given yep. when he was acting Assistant Secretary for Housing. Once he left in December of, of 86, he... he he got involved in managing real estate and in, in by 1988 wanted to get back in and wondered what was going on. I mean, you have to ask him why well, he would well, well, But see, this is, this is the guy, one of your predecessors, who you rightfully say you're taking the hit for a lot of people and maybe you don't deserve it at all. Because as you point out, you made a change. But this is an individual who was part of that process. You're telling me he, he found it so bad he quit. That's what your testimony is. No, my testimony is that when it came time to sign documents given to him to fund my rehab units, he left town. As soon as they were signed by some, uh, a oh. subordinate, he came back into town. I'm then, sorry. Okay, I, I, I mean, he didn't quit I didn't, I didn't know that was possible. I, you, I thought your name had to be on it. I thought his name. He had your title. So you're saying underlings could have signed the documents. When, when I'm out of town, I designate someone as acting. Well, then let me just take this. I mean, it's fairly clear he, he had a problem with, with uh, signing these documents. It is very clear. Yeah, and that he kind of smelled a rat. I don't know what he smelled, but he left town. Well, he left town. <laughs> and ultimately, he comes back into town to introduce his fiancée and to talk no, to no, you. No, a period of years lapsed. I mean, let, let's get it sequentially. Well, what, in, 80s, what, in fiscal year 86. I, I don't care when it was. Right. He came back to town. I mean, and now he's on the other side. You know, it, it, it smelled when he was there, and now he's on the other side. And he has, he's asking for a document that a lot of people didn't even know existed. It was a public document because it had been sent out. But didn't he get access to this document before some people in the, in the regions uh, found out about it? He wasn't asking for the document before it existed. He asked innocently, what's new with Mod Rehab? Has anything changed? I replied, Yes, you wouldn't believe the change. This is the document w which we are just now faxing or sending out to the field, which is now public information. Here it is. Here's how it's changed. Okay. 
Do you think that he got this document before a lot of people in the field got it? He got it the day it was signed. I don't know who got it the day it was faxed, and I don't okay. know how, how long. I mean, it, it, it's a public document which describes procedure. It is not a, a document that is an internal, top secret. I hear you. Let me just say, I appreciate your candidness. I appreciate you being here. You were here. You weren't subpoenaed. Um, and that's to your credit. You've put things on the record. And, um, you know, we will be following up. Um, and um, I'm just happy I'm not in your shoes. Please get me a new pair. <laughs> just the, <coughs> are, you, are you finished? Please? Thank you very much. I just have a couple of questions. I'd like Mr. Adams to rejoin the panel. Uh, please, please do not leave yet. We are not yet finished. You're just moving over a bit. First, let me deal with this uh, thick dossier that you have there, uh, Ms. Demery. Um, I haven't dismissed you, yes. Um, is that do is, does that dossier contain items that relate to the decision-making process, or does the dossier merely uh, contain a compilation of applications, and are you prepared to make this available to the Inspector General? The ins this documentation are the letter requests which detail the various, the, the level of need within their community for mod rehab funding. But it doesn't contain anything about the decision-making process, which no. is what we are, which, which we are concerned with. So these are merely, this, was mere, this is merely incoming correspondence. This is what I base, yes, this is incoming correspondence which I base my decisions and recommendations on to the secretary and the committee. All right. And that's how need was, was, was determined. Okay. Mr. Adams, uh, you've been accused here of malice, negligence, and cover-up. Would you care to comment? I'm innocent. <laughs> That's a good no. way to start. Did you, did, did, did you have... I would not like to make light of Mr. Demery's concerns, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I apologize if he considers it to be that. But uh, there was no malice. Uh, I believe that that represents a fair and accurate portrayal of what we found. Was there any attempt at cover-up of any activities or We pursued any all leads that came to our attention to their fullest extent. Uh, we believe that we've made the most accurate portrayal possible of the interviews that we conducted and the records we reviewed. Please. The only problem I have is why would his name be on the document? I mean, it strikes me as kind of strange. Well, we gave that much thought, uh, Mr. Shays, in the process. It was not taken lightly. Uh, Mr. Demery uh, was the most recent occupant of the position in the decision-making mm -hmm. process and also had the additional element of the food and other things that were not present in others. Mm -hmm. Don't you think with hindsight it might have just uh, been better not to have his name on it, considering that in fact there are so many players in this? It possibly so, sir. Yeah. <laughs> the other question I have uh, that I would like you to react to, uh, Mr. Demery makes a point that with the new procedures, there was, quote, unquote, a dramatic and significant change, end quote. Was there, in, view, in your view, a dramatic and significant change or only some marginal improvement? I believe there were substantial changes in Mr. Chairman, and we so recognized in both our, our audit report. Uh, we still had some concerns, as Mr. Demery has acknowledged. And I think that may have been a factor in uh, the Secretary's consideration and the withdrawal of the process, hoping to find the most fair and the most objective process by which to allocate the funds. I want to thank all three of you gentlemen. Our final witness this morning is Mr. Angus Olson, Executive Director of the Alexandria Housing and Redevelopment Authority. We're pleased to have you, Mr. Olson. Before I swear you in, I would like to express my appreciation to Ms. Celia Boddington of the subcommittee staff who did most of the preparatory work for this uh, hearing. Um, will you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please be seated. 
<coughs> Mr. Olson, your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. You may proceed any way you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. My name is Angus Olson, and I am Executive Director of the Alexandria Redevelopment and Housing Authority in Alexandria, Virginia. We call the authority ARHA, and I'll be referring to it as such. I also serve on the Board of Directors of the National Leased Housing Association, NLHA, on whose behalf I am testifying today. NLHA is a national association whose membership is comprised of more than 750 member organizations dedicated to the development and management of rental housing, which is affordable to low-income persons. NLHA takes pride in its diverse membership of private and public sector participants in federally assisted low-income housing programs. This includes developers, financers, management agents, local housing authorities, nonprofit organizations, and, and state housing agencies. We are here today to discuss the Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Program, known in the housing community as Mod Rehab. My comments are intended to provide support for the continuation and growth of the program, and will focus on two facets. First, how the success of the program is in large part a result of a program design which permits great flexibility to local housing agencies in meeting local housing priorities. And second, the impact of one mod rehab project in the city of Alexandria. The bottom line in this testimony is that this is a good and successful housing assistance program that should not be scrapped as a result of alleged abuses uncovered by the HUD Office of, of the Inspector General. Those, those uh, abuses relating to the manner in which program funds have been allocated. The Mod Rehab Program was created by Congress as a part of the Section 8 existing program under the Housing and Community Development Amendments Act of 1978, the 1978 Amendments. And this is now made part of the United States Housing Act of 1937 and codified under 24 CFR 882.401. The 1978 amendments were enacted with the stated goals of upgrading substandard rental housing in the United States and providing rental subsidy for lower income families. Public housing authorities, PHAs, were authorized to use subsidy funds of the Mod Rehab Program to provide rental assistance to low income persons residing in properties needing physical rehabilitation. Therefore, by ensuring an adequate, adequate income stream to the rental project, important local housing and redevelopment objectives can be achieved, including increasing and or preserving affordable housing opportunities for low-income persons, deconcentrating large neighborhoods of assisted housing, revitalizing targeted neighborhoods, and minimizing displacement of low-income households. Of particular significance is the fact that the designers of the program believed that the program would be considerably less costly to implement than the Section 8 Substantial Rehabilitation Program that was then in effect. To date, the Mod Rehab Program has facilitated the rehabilitation of over 131,000 low-income units. The design of the Mod Rehab Program is delightfully simple. The ability to target the housing assistance provided through the program to achieve local objectives has made the Mod Rehab Program an exceptionally popular program among local housing agencies. In general terms, the program is structured so that PHAs may attach Section 8 rental assistance benefits to specific properties rather than to be designated for mobile use by qualified tenant households as in the case of the Section 8 existing <coughs> Finders Keepers program. PHAs participating in the program solicit and receive proposals from property owners who are interested in obtaining a guaranteed stream of rental income in the form of rental subsidy for low-income tenants after the property has been rehabilitated. The PHA then proceeds to select properties for participation in the program. Selection criteria may be tailored to meet the targeted local housing needs. In this way, the Mod Rehab Program can be tailored uh, easily to the specific needs of the community, <coughs> unlike, for example, the Federal Public Housing Program, which, while meeting a great need across uh, this country for affordable housing, is generally uniform in communities across the country. There is a great range of the types of housing which may be used in the Mod Rehab Program, again providing local PHAs with the flexibility required to meet specific local needs. Eligible housing includes single-family homes, multifamily projects, 
group residences, and single room occupancy units, so long as the properties are rental units and not owner occupied, although for the purposes of mod rehab, cooperatives are considered rental housing. Once programs are selected by the PHA for participation in the mod rehab program, the, the PHA and the property owner enter into a 15-year housing assistance payment or HAP contract under which the PHA administers the rent subsidy to the owner. The PHA also takes on the role of overseeing the rehabilitation work so as to guarantee that HUD housing quality standards are met. After rehabilitation is complete, the PHA administers the rental assistance benefits to eligible lower income persons residing in the property. Moderate rehabilitation is defined as the minimum of $1,000 of rehabilitation work per housing unit, which amount includes a prorated share of work to be accomplished on common areas or major project systems, so long as the rehabilitation expenditures fall into two broad categories. To upgrade the property to meet uh, HUD hop, uh, housing quality standards, or to repair or replace major building systems that are in danger of failure. Therefore, mod rehab assistance cannot be attached to properties requiring only routine maintenance, upkeep or repairs other than of a modest nature, but neither does the program require the costly expenses of a gut rehab. <clears throat> While there is no specific maximum limit to the amount of rehabilitation which is permitted under the program, some control is established through the calculation of what is called contract rent. The fair market rents, FMR, under the moderate rehab program are 120 percent of the FMR schedule for the Section 8 existing program. HUD can, on an individual project basis, approve exception rents up to the 130 percent level. The initial contract rent is calculated to equal the base rent plus the monthly amortization cost of the rehabilitation financing, so long as this initial contract rent does not exceed the mod rehab FMR. This setting of contract rent as relating to monthly debt service is yet another way in which local flexibility is achieved in the Mod Rehab program. Therefore, as you can see, the Mod Rehab program is a very successful tool in meeting targeted local housing priorities and has had great impact on the development of affordable housing opportunities. In Alexandria, Virginia, the Mod Rehab program assisted us in preserving and upgrading an existing affordable housing project. In 1980, ARHA and the city began exploring development options for a 111-unit public housing project, then known as the George Parker Homes. The project occupies two full square blocks located in the heart of gentrified Old Town Alexandria. And this project was originally constructed in 1942. It was some of the earliest public housing constructed in this country. But in 1980, ARHA found itself in the position, position of being land rich without financial resources either to continue to maintain our assisted housing programs or to develop new housing so badly needed in the expensive Northern Virginia rental housing market. Debt service on the George Parker homes expired in 1980. And as the public housing subsidies were inadequate to support the site, we informed HUD that we did not wish to amend the agreement with HUD to continue to receive subsidy for the site, which was the usual practice then among PHAs. When the contract with HUD expired, we began to independently maintain the site through our operating reserves as we developed alternative plans. At the time, ARHA was reported to be the only PHA in the country that did not continue to receive public housing operating subsidy for projects on which the debt service had ended. If we had accepted the subsidy, HUD mandated that we would have had to continue to maintain the site as public housing for 10 more years. We did not feel that this was reasonable, one, since there was no guarantee of improved subsidy levels or modernization funding to perform the badly needed housing improvements at the site, and two, ARHA and the city wished to maintain greater flexibility in meeting local housing needs. ARHA decided to rehabilitate the project and to preserve it as publicly assisted housing through the Section 8 Mod Rehab Program. While the structures themselves were sound, each home was in dire need of modernization and weatherization. The units had antiquated bathrooms and kitchens, were very energy inefficient, and generally were in a deteriorating uh, condition. Major systems also needed repair or replacement, such as heating, electrical, and plumbing. 
By rehabilitating the units, we upgraded the affordable housing stock in the city and met an important local priority. In 1983 and in 1982, we applied for and received from HUD sufficient mod rehab allocations to subsidize 100 percent of this project. However, while the Section 8 program offers rent subsidy, it does not finance property rehabilitation. Thus, our second step in the process was to raise funds to perform the actual rehab work. Financing was achieved through the exercise in 1984 of our tax-exempt bond powers, supported by the FHA 221D3 uh, insurance program. ARHA issued tax-exempt bonds in the amount of $3,280,000, enabling us to perform close to $20,000 worth of rehab work on each unit. Due to the regulatory prohibition against attaching mod rehab subsidy to rental units owned by the PHA administering the Annual Contributions Contract, or ACC, ARHA entered into a reciprocity agreement with the PHA of a neighboring jurisdiction, in this case Fairfax County, under which such PHA administers the subsidy for the ARHA project, and ARHA does the same with respect to a property located in the neighboring jurisdiction, thus maintaining the arm's length distance intended by the regulation. The property, now known as Hopkins Tansel Courts, is today very successful, provides quality affordable housing to low-income Alexandrians. With the Mod Rehab Program, ARHA was thus able to flexibly meet certain important local housing objectives, including preserving all 111 units of affordable housing badly needed in the upscale and costly Northern Virginia real estate market and improving the quality of such housing through the rehabilitation. Our 10 years of experience with the program makes us believe that Mod Rehab can be one of HUD's most successful housing efforts. That is why it is a great shame that this program may be in jeopardy as a result of administrative problems at HUD. Certainly, any deficiencies uncovered by the HUD Inspector General in the allocation of funds or in the carrying out of the program procedures must be corrected so as to restore the integrity of the program. In that regard, we commend Secretary Kemp and his new administration for the prompt and forceful actions to remedy the defects in program awards and procedures. However, it would be a tragedy to low-income persons facing a lack of affordable housing if past administrative deficiencies result in no program at all. Thank you for permitting me to share my thoughts with you today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Olson, for your very fine testimony and the good program you're running in Alexandria. Let me just say, before I ask you a couple of questions, we are in full accord with you. We think this is potentially an excellent program, as does Secretary Kemp. And what we want to be certain of is that, A, the selection process is fair, so every part of the country has an equal crack at it. And secondly, the program is run in such a fashion that the taxpayer is not overcharged some $400 million. But we fully agree with you. It's a useful program. It's a needed program. And what we want to do is to strengthen the program and make it function effectively and honestly. You have heard much of the testimony. We have been here now for almost four hours. Um, do you believe a consultant is needed to apply for a moderate rehabilitation grant? Mr. Chairman, we did not use uh, a consultant in our application. Uh, consultants may play a uh, reasonable role in some of the development process, uh, particularly with uh, developers who may, may not be uh, as experienced as, as some others. Uh, but uh, in, my, in my opinion, I don't think we didn't need it. And, uh, I, I, I don't really see the need for one. You really don't see the need for it. What would you estimate is the average income of your, uh, of your occupant in your various units? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, average income of the occupants in our units at this project is $8,300 a year. In comparison to the uh, median income in the Washington Standard Metropolitan Statistical Area, that is way below 50% of the median. The median is $51,000 for a family of four per annum. You have heard of uh, consulting fees running into hundreds of thousands of dollars. As a citizen, what is your reaction to 
say, former Secretary of the Interior Watt getting $300,000 for some casual conversation in person or on the telephone with uh, the average annual income of your occupant family being $8,300. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as a citizen, I wish that money could be in the project itself. Well, you're in good company because that's exactly what the subcommittee fears. Mr. Shays. How would you know that this money exists and that you should apply for these grants? There uh, are announcements made and uh, uh, an application or a letter is sent in to uh, the D.C. field office, in my case, with, there are many field offices around the country. It is then reviewed and forwarded to the regional office, which is the Philadelphia office in my case, and then on to, uh, to the central or headquarters office. It just strikes me, though, that someone like yourself who's in the know is in a lot better cir circumstance than someone else who may not have all that much experience in this area. Well, it would be atypical for a local housing authority to be a sponsor, such as we were in this particular project. It, it's, it's typical for a private developer to be, mm. to be the sponsor. So in, in that regard, I guess we were a little more uh, knowledgeable, perhaps, because the notices were coming to us. That did not preclude us from advertising for the, uh, the, the units. And uh, at that time in, uh, uh, in our history, there were other Section 8 programs, such as the sub-rehab and new construction program. And there just wasn't that much interest in uh, in the mod rehab program during that era. And hence, there were no other takers but us, the public entity. We were very pleased to be able to utilize it. Thank you. Well, this is the first of a series of hearings this subcommittee has scheduled on this whole issue. And uh, even the first hearing reveals, in the first place, gross abuses in the program in the past, the wisdom of Secretary Kemp's decision in uh, calling for major changes and in uh, insisting that the 1989 funding decisions be reevaluated. We will be hearing from uh, all of the individuals uh, who had a key role to play in this activity. Uh, former officials of HUD, including Secretary Pierce, consultants, including Secretary Watt. And our hope is that the program, once cleaned up, will go on to serve the needs of uh, the vast numbers of families and individuals who need uh, low-income housing in rehabilitated units. We want to thank you, Mr. Olson. This hearing is concluded. You've been watching a hearing on alleged abuses in federal housing contracts. For more information, you may contact the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing, room B349, Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20.